Welcome to MSNBC's special coverage of the Iowa caucuses. I'm Jen Psaki. It's 4 o'clock here in New York, 3 p.m. in Des Moines, where in just a few hours, the doors will open at caucus locations across the state, and the first votes will be cast in the 2024 election. Voters going to the polls today in 1,600 precincts across all of Iowa's 99 counties will do it in some of the most brutal conditions imaginable. Tonight could be the coldest Iowa caucus ever. Wind chills could get as low as 45 degrees Fahrenheit. That is freezing. That brutal cold is putting a damper on what is normally a frenzy of campaigning in the final days. The Trump campaign and the Haley campaign canceled three events this past weekend, but that doesn't mean candidates aren't asking people to get out and vote. The ex-president told people at a rally yesterday, quote, even if you vote and then pass away, it's worth it. Yes, he really said that. There is no early voting and no mail-in ballot, so all of it comes down to turnout tonight in just a few hours. The last NBC News Des Moines Register poll of the cycle released last night shows Trump with a commanding 28-point lead. If he wins by anything close to that amount, that would shatter a record held by GOP presidential candidate Bob Dole, who won Iowa by 13 points in 1996. That brings us to one of the big questions tonight. Who will come in second place and head into the next contest? It's one of the most interesting questions of tonight. The next contest is, of course, the New Hampshire primary. With momentum, and who will go into that with momentum become Donald Trump's main foil? Both Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis are hoping for a better than expected second place finish. And for DeSantis, who's visited all 99 counties and landed the endorsement of, the, of Iowa's governor, the stakes are particularly high tonight. With questions swirling about whether his campaign can survive a third place finish, whether he can justify staying in the race. But let's not lose, lose sight of what a Trump win in Iowa would mean. If the polls are correct from this weekend, Iowa Republicans could set in motion a primary that leads to the nomination of an ex-president who's facing 91 felony counts in four different jurisdictions. 17 of those counts for trying to overturn a free and fair election through any means, including violence. An ex-president who has said he'd be a dictator on day one, who, if elected, would spark some serious doubts about the survival of our democracy. Here to talk about all of this this hour to kick it off, at the table with me here is former Obama campaign manager and MSNBC political analyst, my former boss, too, David Pluff, and former RNC chairman and co-host of The Weekend here on MSNBC, Michael Steele, always fun to hang out with for these late nights. Plus, Amy Walter joins us. She's the publisher and editor-in-chief of the Cook Political Report and former U.S. Senator and MSNBC political analyst Claire McCaskill. She's co-host of the MSNBC podcast, How to Win 2024, a good must-listen. Let's start out in Des Moines, Iowa, though. Uh, that's where everything's happening in just a couple of hours. And NBC News uh, correspondent Ali Vitale has been there braving, braving all the temperatures out at the campaign event. So, Ali, I know you're with the, cam the Haley campaign. Uh, right now, how are they feeling about everything going into tonight? Well, look, yeah, you're right, Jen. I have been following the Haley campaign while also braving these icy temperatures here. And that's going to be one of the key things that we're watching for tonight because the old trope, as you all know, is it all comes down to turnout, which is true. But it's hard to predict what turnout looks like when you're at a negative 30 wind chill across the state. So certainly that's one of the things that's going to unfold in real time for all of us. For the Haley campaign's part, though, they sort of feel like they're in a good position tonight. It's a win-win regardless of how they place. Of course, they want to come in second, in the words of what one advisor told me, that would be a boom moment within this caucus and within this larger primary. But also, if they come in third and that margin is pretty tight with Ron DeSantis, they sort of feel like that's exactly what the original expectation was anyway. For Haley, though, second place clearly preferred because it allows them to dispense with the notion that Ron DeSantis has a continuously viable path to the nomination. And instead, it allows the Haley campaign to underscore a narrative that they've been driving towards the entire time she's been a candidate, which is that they want it to seem like a one-on-one -on -one race between her and Donald Trump by the time they get on the ground in New Hampshire. I love all these closing arguments. It's also kind of justification for what you see in this last Des Moines Register poll. Everybody's spinning yeah. a lot out there. I know also, Ali, that you, you spoke with Nikki Haley yesterday. I mean, there are kind of a version of closing arguments being made by these candidates. What's her case uh, to voters? What did she tell you when you spoke? Well, look, for voters, she's just consistently told them she wants to point to the idea that there are some polls that show her more competitive in a general election 
against President Joe Biden than the former President Donald Trump. But electability arguments are tough to make in a primary that has been so driven by the cult of personality and ideology of Trumpism. And therein is where Haley has been making somewhat of a policy or ideology pitch, which is she'll regularly say that she liked the Trump policies and believes that he was the right president for that time. But she also seeks to make a generational change argument. I think that's one of the interesting pieces here. And as I talk to Haley voters, many of them are ex-Trump voters, if I'm talking to people who are Republicans. But if we're watching the coalition that she's trying to build, and this bears out in our new NBC News Des Moines Register poll, there is a pretty large contingent of independents and Democrats who could make up her coalition into second or third place tonight. That's going to be interesting to watch, especially as it plays out on the ground in New Hampshire, where you guys know well that is also likely to be a big part of the group that she brings in. My big question to her when I spoke with her yesterday in a pull aside backstage is can you win the Republican nomination with the backing of independents and Democrats just as much as you have Republicans? She made an argument that that's exactly the kind of big tent that her party should be trying to build. But I think that we all know that that's sort of a pre Trump way of thinking. I mean, everything that we think about within this political sphere is changed because of Trump's role in this race. I mean, in theory, we should be talking about how Ron DeSantis is running away with the caucus because he invested in ground game, he invested in it early, put all of his resources here, notched almost all the endorsements that you can think of if you were thinking of a dream slate of endorsements in the state of Iowa. He's been here doing almost more than double the events that someone like Nikki Haley has done, and certainly far and away more events than Donald Trump has done. And yet, Trump is not just winning, but winning by miles and miles here in the Hawkeye state. I do think that that's a pretty stunning rebuke of the traditional way that you're supposed to win Iowa. No, no question, Allie. And, and this question of can she compete and win if she doesn't expand her coalition yeah. beyond independents, never Trumpers, and Democrats, I think we all yeah. know the answer to that question. Ali Vitale, we will let you get back to your reporting. Uh, look forward to talking to you later again this evening. Thanks, um, and right now we're going to go to our panel and just talk to you guys about uh, what we just what we just heard. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting to me just hearing how these candidates are pre-spinning what the outcome could be tonight. And there's a lot to watch. Turnout, not, not necessarily who wins first. We know that. Who wins second? Uh, what are you watching most, Pluff? You, you've run successful Iowa caucus campaigns before, of course. Well, I think it really comes down to the margin. So let's say Trump were to get under 50. You know, I think there'll be some sense that he didn't match his numbers in the polls. I don't think it matters that much, honestly, whether Haley comes in second or third, mm -hmm. because DeSantis is dead after tonight, no matter what. Regardless. You yeah, think. he's got nothing going in New Hampshire. So I think at the end of the day, in reality, this is a two-person race after tonight. If Haley comes in second, that's a nice talking point to have. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, what, what's interesting, Jen, having run these before, you spend a year basically on one state, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And then at breakneck pace, you begin to get state after state after state. So we have New Hampshire next week. Let's say Haley's able to beat Trump there. Then the question is her home state looms, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably the perfect state, not for her, but for Donald Trump in today's Republican which primary. Which the electorate is much more like Iowa than it is yeah. New Hampshire. And so as I think about this primary, it's basically you have Nevada and South Carolina then in February. And then, you know, Super Tuesday's looming out there. And the question is, can Haley from, let's say she's able to do well enough tonight to help her win New Hampshire next week. Basically, in those six weeks between then and Super Tuesday, can she really get to the point where she can stare down Trump in a one-on-one? -on -one? And in some states, particularly where they allow Democrats and independents, which mm -hmm. is not all. Yep. Um, so it'll be a different map that way, you know, get 50%. So I think at the end of the day, yeah, that's the big question is, whether DeSantis gets out tonight or not, I mean, he's going to get, what, four or five in New Hampshire? Which, if you're Haley, you'd rather him get zero. But this is a two-person race after tonight, in my opinion. Let, let's talk, I want to come back to Haley, but let's talk about DeSantis for a moment. Because you've talked to these campaigns and candidates, Michael Steele, not always easy conversations, no, I bet. It's when it's painful. like, okay, my friend, you've run a race. You've gone to all 99 counties. There's not a big, beautiful path forward for you. I mean, DeSantis' team is saying, like, we're in it to win it. We're in it to South Carolina and New Hampshire. What are the conversations happening right now behind the scenes at the DeSantis campaign? And do you think he'll still be in after tonight? Well, that's a good question. I think on paper, the answer would be no, he's not in it. Uh, but as David knows, there's, a, a, there's an, an attitude about running, particularly for the candidate. That is not a decision that, you know, any of us will make, not anyone on his staff. 
where if he still thinks he's got some juice to go to New Hampshire or South Carolina, that he can make up some back end piece after having spent no time in either of those locations. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to stay in the race. That's one. Two, if he gets out of the race, what does he do? Does he do like all the other men who've gotten out of the race and, and kept endorse? their mouth shut and kept their mouth shut? Or does he endorse Nikki Haley and sort of create a little win for her sales to go into New Hampshire? Number three. Or does he endorse Trump? It's another Or does court. he endorse Trump? Number three, does he that does he look at South Carolina and look at Nikki Haley and go, well, damn, she's down 30 points in her own state. So yeah, there's some juice to play there. And yeah. just and just said, okay, we're going to take the hit in New Hampshire, and we're just going to go mess up things in in South Carolina. Four, all those scenarios, Donald Trump is still the man. At some point, if Nikki does catch fire, in what universe does Donald Trump play ball with Nikki Haley and say, you know, you're beating me, I'm just going to let you beat me? No, in fact, he kind of warned that that's exactly the opposite of what he's going to do. I, I want to bring in Amy and Claire here. And Amy, I, I want to peel off of something that David said, which was about Trump and getting more than 50 percent, because there is this question of, like, what defines success for him, even though this is not hardly the end of the race, it's not the end of the primary. But you wrote a piece about this. So give us a sense of, like, what we should be watching with Trump's number specifically, regardless of the order of events. Yeah, I think that is exactly right. The margin to me isn't quite as interesting as whether he gets 50% plus, because the argument from the Haley and DeSantis wing from the very beginning of this race was, you know, Donald Trump has a core group of ride or die voters, but it's not as big as it looks. Maybe it's 35%. It's a good day in a place like Iowa, maybe 40%. But there is a bigger coalition out there of never Trump and sometimes Trump voters that if we get to a one-on-one -on -one contest, this is what this Iowa race has always been about, winnowing it down to one-on-one -on -one contest, there are enough of those voters out there to be able to beat him 50, you know, 1% to 45%, whatever. Um, if he's getting over 50% in a state, by the way, that he lost in 2016, in a state where, yes, in some ways, it's very much uh, friendly territory for him. It's one of the few states that he improved his margin from 2016 to 2020 in the general election. But as Ali pointed out in, in her stand-up, it's also a state that having the evangelical leadership behind you is supposed to be a game changer. That's what Ron DeSantis has had. Mm -hmm. It's done very little to help him. Where the evangelical vote was split in the last election, it is absolutely aligned behind Donald Trump this time. And so I agree with everything that's been laid out here, which is the challenge for Nikki Haley. I remember I was at her kickoff event in South Carolina. Was that last year? It all It's all kind of running together <laughs> when it was. It's a long, but long it, campaign it feels like it was, cycle, Amy. It was like the spring, I think, of last year. And the hit on her from the, the Republican, especially the Republican-leaning conservative media was, she sounds like a throwback candidate, a pre-Trump candidate. And that's kind of what this race, at least at this point, assuming that the polls are correct, assuming she's the one that moves on, not DeSantis, but it feels like it's the last gasp of the kind of candidate that Republicans used to nominate. You look at the general election polling, and there's no doubt she is the strongest candidate to face Joe Biden. But remember, these Republican primary voters, they're not, they don't believe that to be the mm -hmm. case. They still think Donald Trump is the strongest. And so many of them, they picked Donald Trump in 2016 because they had been told by the leadership, by the elites, that John McCain, 2008, he was our strongest candidate, even though they didn't really love him. Same with Mitt Romney in 2012. They weren't, they weren't big fans of Mitt Romney. Oh, but he's the most electable candidate. So they went with those electable candidates, and they were disappointed. Now they're going to go with their heart, and Donald Trump still has their heart. I mean, poor Nikki Haley. She was maybe born in the wrong era or decade or something. Um, Claire McCaskill, uh, there's a lot to watch, obviously, tonight, even, even with the Trump being so far ahead in the polls. To Amy's point, I mean, one of the interesting things to me is that Nikki Haley has kind of a Marco Rubio support base a little bit. I mean, Polk County, Scott County, and the eastern part of the state, those are places where it's more educated um, voters uh, who might be more inclined to support her. What are you kind of watching tonight to see at least if Haley has a good night? 
Well, first of all, you have to understand that margins matter, as David said. But you know what else matters coming out of Iowa and tumbling into this breakneck speed that David talked about is money. Uh, if you look at the money here, it is astounding how much money DeSantis and Nikki Haley have spent in Iowa. Both of them have spent around $35 million all in. So $70 million, and Trump has spent $11 million. And they have not really moved the needle. And I think the evangelical vote is another thing to look at carefully. You know, he put out a video last week that really offended a lot of evangelical leaders because it was a video that basically said that Trump is godlike. And there were some leaders in the state that said that made them uncomfortable. But you know what? Those evangelical leaders may have the same problem that union leaders have sometimes. That is, they may feel one way, but the flock may vote another. It's such an important point. I mean, the whole question of whether endorsements even matter is going to probably be one we're discussing later, given Ron DeSantis has had a lot of them. Okay, let's bring in NBC's Vaughn Hilliard, who is driving, it sounds like. Okay, I'm glad you're not driving, but you're in the passenger seat in between right. uh, Trump campaign events. You're, be you're going between Fort Dodge to Des Moines. So tell us, you've been through a few of these election cycles before. Claire was talking a little bit about the evangelical vote. That's definitely been a big change since 2016, certainly for Trump. Tell us what feels different to you this time around. It's, it's telling if we're talking about the evangelical vote. If you listen to some of the prayers, Jen, that, uh, uh, that the pastors deliver during the invocation at Trump's rallies, they sound so Trumpian in the way that it would have been unfathomable to have heard come out of the mouth of a preacher at a political event eight years ago. Using the words of, the, right, there's uh, Orwellian tyranny that is taking over the United States. This idea that, uh, you know, that evil has come onto the United States and it's Donald Trump, one pastor, uh, referring to him as the second coming here and uh, a foreshadowing of what is to come if he gets back in the White House. This is, you know, back in 2016, and I think that there was 22% of the evangelicals here, the caucus for Donald Trump, we're looking at in our NBC Des Moines Register poll, 51%. The other part is, look at who the stars of the Republican Party are today, who are out here on the road. We just left Fort Dodge. We thought it was important to be up here at one of the final Donald Trump events because it was the, if I may, the MAGA superstar shuttle that came to town about two hours north of Des Moines. It was Marjorie Taylor Greene. It was Matt Gates. Carrie Lake, uh, Jim Jordan, Byron Donalds, uh, Billy Long, uh, a cast of, of Trump loyalists who are frankly the most popular figures in the Republican Party today. And th they were the ones delivering the closing message just hours before caucus opens. That is what is uh, so compelling and that is what ch has changed over these last eight years. I mean, it's such a change from the, the presidential campaigns I worked on, the last ones where we're running against Romney and McCain. It seems very quaint at this point in time. But Vaughn, we can see kind of in your back window there, how snowy and cold it is. We've all been obsessing about the weather, but it is an important question. Campaign has have obviously canceled right. events. What is the expectation in terms of how the weather could play and who could it hurt most here? Right, we have sunny skies here today, and we have over the last 48 hours, but it has remained so deadly cold. A negative wind chill expected this evening of negative, negative 35 that the snow itself is largely not melted. Here on the main highways, the snow plows have all but cleared the roads, but a lot of the side roads and through the smaller towns, even including medium-sized towns like Fort Dodge, there is still a layer of ice over most of the streets. And so that is really going to be the concern of just, especially for older folks, of being able to get in the car make it to these caucus sites and walk through over black ice. You know, Donald Trump often has said over the last days that his supporters will, will, will walk over broken glass, but will they walk over black ice? That's what we're going to have to look. The campaign is offering rides to their supporters. If they call up, they believe that they have built up and contend they have built up an operation, unlike that of eight years ago when it was sort of haphazard, folks just showing up to rallies, but in terms of actually activating those folks to come out and caucus, it's a different story. This time around, though, they believe they've identified a share of the Republican electorate here that will be able to give them a consequential win. The organizing aspect is one that's important. We'll talk about that. But we have to take a quick break. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you so much. Safe travels. And the panel is, of course, sticking around.
And when we come back, this weekend's closing arguments from the Republican candidates. Rain some themes from please don't forget about me, I'm still here, to just stay alive and vote, then you can die, it's pretty dark. We'll talk more with our guests about that with just a few short hours to go. Plus, Donald Trump will be trying to fit a campaign stop in this week, not in New Hampshire, not in Pennsylvania, not on Fox News, but in a New York courtroom. The strategy behind that decision just ahead. And still to come, President Joe Biden marking this Martin Luther King Jr. Day with Reverend Al Sharpton for a look at the issues and work still ahead for black Americans. Much more news to get to when MSNBC's special coverage of the Iowa caucuses continues after this. So don't go anywhere. We're going to do well. Uh, and I think, look, I, I, um, I appreciate being the underdog. I like how people have tried to say, oh, uh, what? So, so I do better in those situations. And I think I have a record of, of doing well um, as the underdog. But, but we're going to do well. We feel it. We know that this is moving in the right direction. And to me, the only numbers that matter are the ones that we're going up and everybody else went down. That shows that we're doing the right thing. I think Iowans will decide intensity tomorrow. You're going to be first in the nation. So brave the weather and go out and save America because that's what you're doing. Three candidates, three closing messages in the waning hours of caucus eve in Iowa. Lots of spinning, too, of what's all going to happen. Ron DeSantis appears to be embracing the underdog narrative after saying he was going to win for many, many months. Because how else can he spin it when polls have him firmly in third place there at this point? As for Nikki Haley, her closing statement is all about momentum. She's got the mo. Presented with concerns about a lack of enthusiasm among her supporters, Haley suggested tomorrow will prove, tonight will prove, she's the clear alternative to Donald Trump. As for the disgraced ex-president himself, you heard his closing message, the weirdest and creepiest and darkest of them all. Even if you vote, then die. It'll be worth it. And then there's Trump's most targeted messaging. He's done it before, vague accusations and implied threats. Listen to what he said about Nikki Haley this weekend. I'm working for you, and she's working for a lot of other people, people that don't necessarily love our country so much. She's, you're not going to find, you're going to find out a lot about her in the next short period of time. But she's starting to fade as people find out. Very mobby and mysterious there. We're back with David Pluff, Michael Steele, Amy Walter, and Claire McCaskill. So, Claire, I know Trump says a lot of crazy things every day, but I do think we have to start with what he just said there, which is, I mean... You could say it's sort of a little threatening, but it's basically, to me, I hear it as, I'm going to come get you, Nikki, if you come close to me. But how did you hear it? Well, the irony of this guy saying, you know, she's supported by people who don't love America, and he is besties with Putin and Kim Jong-un and Erdogan and all of the folks that are autocrats and freedom haters and despots and, frankly, murderous thugs. Um, he's got a rogue of horrible people behind him, and, and, and even China. I mean, he wants to talk about Nikki Haley in China. He, he loves Xi, he just loves him. <laughs> so I, I, I really think that Haley's best argument is that she's a new face. People always like change. You know, we keep talking about a rematch. It's only happened about seven or eight times in our country that the same two candidates have run against each other again. Mm -hmm. But in this instance, they both have been president. And this is really, um, you know, old faces, old folks. And Haley is going to try to be the next generation, the new face, and at the same time, She's making fun of DeSantis for being the mini-me of, of Trump. I mean, she's running an ad that's saying, you know, to DeSantis, who's your daddy, referring to Trump. Yeah. <laughs> so she is really doing some interesting things that are negative in regards to Trump, more so than she ever has before. I mean, she may be getting serious about actually running against him. I mean, w watch out, world. And some of that, interestingly enough, is helping Biden in New Hampshire. But anyway, back to Trump. Amy, another thing that he likes to do, we've seen over the past several cycles, is kind of claim fraud when thing gets, things get a little close, too close for comfort. I just want to play something um, he recently said and get your thoughts on it. So important that you get out and vote. So important that you watch other communities because we don't want this election stolen from us. We don't want this election solo. I hear these horror shows. 
And we have to make sure that this election is not stolen from us and is not taken away from us. And everybody knows what I'm talking about. The only way we're going to lose this election is if the election is rigged. Remember that. It's the only way we're going to lose this election. Okay, so those was, that was actually past times he's claimed fraud. But he did say, he posted this morning, Nikki just said on Fox and Friends that she's up in the polls, but I'm beating her by 57 points. Not exactly, but what's up? I mean, there's lots of implications here, but one of them could be she's up to something. But how did you hear it? And do you think this is something like he could have up his sleeve if he, if anyone gets too close to com for comfort for him? Yeah, you know, remember in 2016, uh, he never claimed to have lost right. uh, Iowa. In fact, he argued that it was Ted Cruz that cheated. And uh, but so this is sort of par for the course. But at the same time, um, you know, the Trump campaign itself is running a pretty traditional campaign, I would say. I, I, you know, for the folks sitting in uh, on this panel, all of whom have been through campaigns, they know that if you're the front runner and you see somebody coming up close to you, of course, you're going to unload everything, every oppo you piece of oppo you have on that candidate going forward to make sure they don't get much traction. And so, uh, you know, they've already started running ads up in New Hampshire, making that link. Um, I, I think, as Claire McCaskill said, with China, trying to argue that she's part of that globalist insider elite class, that she's not going to look out for regular folks. So I think the advertising itself, I mean, this is mm. this is always the challenge for the Trump campaign, which is the campaign itself is actually running a very smart, strategic playbook. The candidate himself does not ever stick to script. And so that's where, you know, you could do all the great groundwork, but at the end of the day, what people are going to remember is what the candidate actually said, not how the campaign actually performed and what their ideal message would have been. Yes, it turns out. Sometimes people do remember their local organizer in Fort Dodge or something that does have an impact, but we were just talking about this briefly during the break. I mean, Trump's campaign, to Amy's point, is better run by all accounts than last time. It's a little bit better organized. What kind of a factor do you think that is here? Well, it, it makes a difference on the margins. I will say, by the way, if the Trump campaign is providing rides to caucus locations, given what he said over the weekend, I'm sure they're one-way rides. It's kind of the way <laughs> Grandma Esther, you Grandma Esther, you on your find own. your way back. Yeah, you, you, yeah I, there's no question about that. So it matters, and, and I think it'll matter more kind of post New Hampshire. By the way, if Trump loses New Hampshire, there's no doubt his core message is going to be was stolen from me. Yes. Nikki's in league with the Democrats. Yeah. And so I think we have to prepare for that. I think what's interesting is uh, DeSantis's closing message is terrible, as his whole campaign has been. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's all about like polls and underdog. And it's awkward. Haley talking momentum, I guess, is OK. Still, that's process. But mm. she is starting to differentiate more. Mm. And that's where she has to get. Uh, you know, I did, her speech tonight will be a big moment to say mm -hmm. that. And I think what she ought to say to Claire's point is the only way America doesn't have a Biden-Trump rematch is if I'm the Republican nominee. Right. Trump can't win. And so I think at the end of the day, that's what we have to watch is how crisp that gets. It's, it's so, I mean, the other night in the debate, we didn't talk about this a ton that night, but she basically said, I wish I was on the stage with Trump because that's who I'm running against. I mean, she's been trying to kind of set it up the race against her. So if you're in the Haley camp, Michael, if you were talking to them, what would you tell them they should be saying tonight? Well, I, I think I would pivot uh, off of what uh, David just said and just make it very clear that not only do I have the momentum, but I'm the only person, and you all know it, you all know it, that can beat Joe Biden. And this is, this is sort of a double-edged sword for Democrats mm. because the reality of it is, yes, yeah, she will beat Joe Biden. If she becomes the Republican nominee... I don't see her losing a presidential race for a lot of reasons that Democrats uh, don't like Joe Biden. All right. So this idea that, you know, the age suddenly goes away when Nikki Haley is the nominee and not Trump. No. So there this she has a way to really do some nice cutting um, coming off of tonight to set herself up both for the remainder of this uh, primary, but also beginning to position tactfully 
uh, for the general election. And, and, you know, as David noted, there are some primaries down the road that where Democrats and independents can play. Mm -hmm. So she can set these, pivot off of New Hampshire, out of Iowa, and make a very nice case for a fall election that I think Democrats could eventually rue. Yeah, I mean, the electorate, though, is very is more like Iowa for a lot of these states than New Hampshire. I, I don't think it's that Democrats don't like Joe Biden, but what I will give you, and I'm surprised you didn't well, say this. Well, they're the only one talking about his age. What, so well, I, no, no, I, I, well, that's what I thought you were going to say, is that if Biden and Trump are running against each other, it's a little hard to make the argument, given they're three years apart. But Nikki Haley could run on a next-gen argument. Right. It's very hard to run for president, I'll just tell you, Michael. Okay, <laughs> no one's going anywhere. Coming up tomorrow, can tomorrow, candidate Donald Trump once again becomes defendant Donald Trump, the ex-president's next big trial. That's coming up next. So I know we're very focused on the Iowa caucus tonight, but tomorrow a trial will begin to decide how much the ex-president must pay E. Jean Carroll for defaming her. He's previously been found liable for sexually assaulting Carroll. The ex-president has said he plans to attend and testify at the trial. Not something he's required to do, by the way. It's something of a campaign tactic at this point for the Republican frontrunner. Though the judge in New York has barred him from offering any testimony or evidence that he did not sexually assault Carroll. Remember, he doesn't exactly take that kind of guidance to heart, even in the courtroom, even last week. Trump did attempt to have the trial delayed, writing to the judge that he could not attend the trial on Wednesday in order to go to the funeral of Melania Trump's mother, his mother-in-law. But the request was denied after Carol's lawyers called him out for having a campaign event scheduled in New Hampshire this very same day. Very awkward and weird and perhaps a discussion for a therapist. Uh, couch. Uh, we're back with our panel. So I just want to start, Michael, there with just this strategy, right? Yeah. Because he has spent more time in the courtroom over the last couple of weeks making his campaign case than he has in Iowa. It hasn't hurt him at all, so maybe that's the lesson he's learned. Right. But how, what do you make of that strategy and how long oh, do you brilliant. think he can, but, but is it going to work in a general election? Should he continue that strategy? Uh, you know, he, he probably will, knowing Trump. I mean, why not? Every platform is a platform to produce whatever he wants produced. So if it's a campaign production, we'll do campaign. If I need a pity party, I'll create a pity party. If I need to blow somebody up like a prosecutor or a judge, guess what? I'll walk out of the courtroom and I'll blow them up. He's like, thanks for the guidance. Thanks for, I'll do what I would well, like. No, it's not, not even so much thanks for the guidance. It's thanks for the platform. Yes. Because for Donald Trump, this is, this is a set. It's a scene in an ongoing drama that he's creating and writing at every turn. And unfortunately, we get sucked into it and tell, help tell that story and that narrative because, yeah, there's history involved here. There's law involved here. There's the Constitution, all these other pieces. So we're trying to, you know, be smart about it. But he knows we're all in the same trap. And he's setting it every time. So he'll show up in that courtroom tomorrow and he'll, I'm here to tell my side of it. And, and he'll start, and I guarantee you, he'll violate the, the yes. requirements of the court. He's like, I don't listen to that kind of right. thing. Right, and then he'll walk out of the courtroom and say, they tried to silence me, this judge, this, th that yeah. judge, that, and this, this is the process. So, as we all know, though, I mean, he, he could be on the verge of locking in the nomination, right? Then the electorate yeah. is much bigger, the broader electorate to win the presidency. I mean, if you're the Biden team, do you hope he keeps doing this courtroom thing? What, what, what is your hope? Well, I'd look at it a couple of different ways. Let's talk about the primary first. So yeah. if Trump wins the New Hampshire primary next Tuesday, I think the general election started. Trump's the nominee. Let's say Haley were to win. Mm -hmm. I don't think she should just say it tonight, but I would say next Tuesday, I think she has to take this head on. Because you're not going to win playing safe. Say, listen, do we want to nominate someone who's on trial, okay, for paying off porn stars, for being accused of rape, for mounting an insurrection? You think that person's going to win? when he couldn't beat Joe Biden last time? Like, I think, now, do I think that's going to get her the nomination? Trump's still the huge favorite. Mm -hmm. In the general election, I think you've got to look at it. There's two sets of voters. For swing voters, I think it just reminds enough of them in the Wisconsin's and Arizona's and Georgia's. They don't want to sign up for the Trump show again. Right. But it's going to help him with his turnout, OK? Mm -hmm. So where that math comes down, I don't know. But I think the Biden campaign can probably take advantage of this with swing voters but it's going to help Trump's turnout. I think it's going to be interesting to see how Haley 
leverages this or not. If she doesn't take a swing on this, she might as well just get out of the race. Like <laughs> the, the path is so narrow as it is, but to me, there is something there in terms of setting this up. I'm the only one that prevent this rematch. A lot of you don't want. I'm the only one that can defeat Biden. And by the way, that is such a strong argument to say, hey, we all think Joe Biden's feeble. He's been a terrible president, terrible candidate, was in the basement. And this guy, Trump, lost to him. You don't think he's going to beat him? Uh, so I think there is an argument she can mount. Again, I think it's a narrow path for her, but it exists. Okay, so the thing that's been so uh, just hard for these candidates, I would say, is that they're kind of damned if they do, damned if they don't, if they criticize him or if they don't. So, Amy, one of the things that struck me about, say, the Des Moines Register poll back in December specifically is the large percentage of people in Iowa who seem to hear things Trump was saying. I'm going to be a dictator echoing Hitler and be like, that's my guy. So, I mean, what do you, if you're Haley, how do you calculate that in terms of needing to differentiate yourself? What kind of could work with the electorate? I mean, this is, again, anybody who's run a campaign knows this. You can tell voters what you want to tell them, or you can meet voters where they are. And bottom line is, Republican voters think that and this is national polls, this is also in the Iowa Register poll, that Donald Trump is the strongest candidate to beat Donald Trump, that the all these legal cases are bunk and they don't believe them. Do not believe that he will be uh, treated fairly. So whether he's found guilty or not, they don't, they see that this is all just a sham. So make, you can make that case till you're blue in the face, it's not gonna help. Uh, convince voters who, already don't believe that to be the case. And the other thing I would say, and I think this has been the real conundrum, Jen, for the presidential candidates is the last two and a half years, the entire Republican establishment, from the leadership in the House and the Senate, all the way through elected officials throughout the country, have said that everything that Trump has done or said is okay. January 6th impeachment, all of those opportunities that Republicans had two plus years ago to say, this isn't okay, we're setting the, the ground rules, uh, they didn't do. And so now you're asking someone like Nikki Haley to come in after two and a half years of, of an ecosystem that has not just supported Donald Trump, but has basically written off all of these other liabilities and she's gonna single-handedly make that case, I just don't think that's possible. Seems hard, seems like a lot to put on her shoulders, yeah. given she should have been born in another decade, as we all agreed. Um, so Claire, you, you have actually been in courtrooms, you're also a political expert, it's sort of a, a fascinating overlap of talents. Um, I think a lot of people are betting, okay, one of these things is gonna get Trump, either the politics or the courtroom, and he seems to have no consequences. Are there consequences for him ignoring the judges in these courtrooms? Do you think it's more likely in the courtroom for there to be consequences or I guess in the political field? Well, I have some really sad news for everybody. I, I, I think we need to get it through our thick skulls that if you look at Donald Trump's polling, and I went back and looked at it over time, you know when he got the bump? You know when he began pulling away from the crowd? When he got indicted in New York for paying a porn star. And you know when it got stronger and stronger? When he got indicted again and again and again. This is his campaign. He is in these courtrooms, not because he has to be, but because he wants to be. He's talking to that judge at, at, at that final argument in, in his, his case recently. He wasn't talking because he was trying to get something from the judge. He knew it was going to hurt him with the judge. He was campaigning. This is his campaign that the government has overreached, and if they do it to him, they can do it to you. And I'm standing in front of them and protecting you. Now, for those of us who've been in a courtroom and understand it's about facts and evidence, this is disgusting. Is it disappointing that college-educated voters have come back to Trump after these indictments? And they have. Many college-educated voters have decided, well, the government's now going too far. I don't know what happens if he's convicted before November. I do think he'll be the nominee. I don't think Haley is going to be able to talk Republican voters off the ledge that somehow the facts and evidence support these indictments. I don't think she's going to be able to. So the question is, will what happened in the courtroom make a difference? 
And will, in the long run, the independent voters have enough enthusiasm that don't want Trump to show up in November? And can we keep our coalition together enthusiasm? Thank you for some real talk, as always, from Claire McCaskill, Amy Walter, David Pluff, Michael Steele, and of course, Claire McCaskill. Thank you all for spending a bunch of time with me this afternoon. Uh, coming up next, a historic fundraising call for President Joe Biden as Democrats prepare to face a Republican challenger. We'll head back out to Iowa right after this. As Iowa Republican caucus goers prepare to make their choice about the future of their party and possibly this country, not to be too dramatic, President Biden spoke to our colleague, Reverend Al Sharpton, about his decision to seek the presidency back in 2020. I didn't want to get involved at all until I saw what happened down in Charlottesville, those, you know, the Ku Klux Klan carrying Nazi flags, ugly, ugly, ugly people. They asked the then president, who's seeking to be president again, what he thought, he said, I thought there were very good people on both sides. Right. Very good people on both sides, for God's sake. And that's when I decided I had to run. Today is Martin Luther King Day, and this is all a sharp reminder of the character of the frontrunner in the Iowa caucuses and the stakes of the 2024 election. Let's bring in Democratic Senator Tina Smith of Minnesota. I'm assured you are warm out there. You are a Minnesotan, too, so I'm assured you are, you are fine out there. But, uh, Senator, I, I wanted to ask you, I, I spent some time with the Biden campaign last week, but take us inside the campaign on a day like today. What are they doing? How are they watching it? How are they consuming all of it? Well, so yes, I'm here in Des Moines and I came south from Minnesota to, to be here. So it's a little chilly, but we'll be fine. I'm really glad to be here because I think that what today is about, first of all, for the Biden campaign is to announce the really incredible fundraising numbers uh, that they announced this morning, showing how much enthusiasm there is for the campaign, including, I would add, this huge uh, grassroots support for the campaign. So I think that's very much on our minds. But the second thing, which is, I think, even more important, is that you know today is the first day that Republicans will be casting their votes in um, the primary election. But overall, the choice and the contrast is so clear. You know, Donald Trump drove the United States economy into the ditch. He left the economy a, a shambles. And Joe Biden has created um, incredible job growth and economic growth. Uh, Donald Trump has said that, um, you know, claim credit for overturning Roe versus Wade, and Joe Biden is committed to protecting women's right to decide for themselves about their own reproductive lives. Um, on taxes, the contrast could not be more clear. So I think today is a day for um, those of us who strongly support President Biden to be making that contrast and explaining what this election is really all about for regular Americans who are um, just beginning to think about the choices ahead. And you're definitely doing your part out on the road. So you mentioned the fundraising numbers. Uh, today, the New York Times uh, reported those and, and others have reported uh, about the fundraising numbers. But they said, quote, uh, President Biden's reelection campaign said on Monday that along with two allied committees, it had pulled in $97 million during the most recent fundraising period. Together, they entered 2024 with more than $117 million in cash on hand. And Jeffrey Katzenberg, who just joined you at a press conference earlier today, noted that the president has received donations from more than a million people. So what should that tell people about what's in the coffers, the strength of that, and kind of where they are in terms of the ability to invest in states across the country? Well, I think it really demonstrates that the Biden campaign, the Biden-Harris campaign, is um, is so poised to make the argument and to define the choice between President Biden and whoever the um, inevitable Republican nominee will be. And what that means is to be going state by state, voter by voter, communicating in all the ways that the campaign can to um, to connect with people and to remind them that their voices are powerful and they have an opportunity to use their voices and their votes this coming November. I mean, that's what elections are all about. And while everyone is uh, talking about, uh, you know, polls and so on and so forth, really, this is just getting going. And I think the campaign is so well positioned to um, to lead us forward. Senator Smith, you're in Iowa, of course, which, which has not been exactly a swing state for some time. Uh, there's a lot more registered Republicans now than there were even back in 2016. But you've been having conversations with people there. What, what have you been hearing about the president's message, what excites people, what they want to see more of? 
Yeah. Well, what I hear from people, first of all, I think it's just important to realize that regular Americans are just coming off of the holidays in Minnesota. They are thinking about when is the ice going to be thick enough for them to get out and go ice fishing. I mean, they're living their lives and they are thinking about what's going on in their lives. And so, um, but what I hear people talking about is how they want somebody who's going to be looking out for regular people when it comes to the economy. And then that's an opportunity to talk about Joe Biden's plan to um, lower costs, the successes that we've had lowering prescription drug costs, the work that we're doing to crack down on junk fees and go after corporate greed that is driving up consumer prices at the grocery stores. When you get down to it and you have a chance to talk to people um, about them and what's going on in their lives, which... Joe Biden is so good at, I think that is how the connection gets made between voters and this candidate and what is going to be a critically important election. In the min seconds we have left, how are you feeling about, how bullish are you feeling about the Minnesota campaign and, and race going on there right now? You know, I feel really good about the Minnesota campaign. My colleague, Amy Klobuchar, will be running for re-election. She will do great. She will be the only statewide election um, and, um, with President Biden and Vice President Harris. So we are going to be doing a lot of work. We don't take anything for granted in Minnesota. We don't do that anywhere. We work really hard for every single vote. Senator Tina Smith, thank you for joining us, for being toasty, and for, you know, being bold because you're a Minnesotan. You came south, as, as you just said. Really appreciate you taking the time. MSNBC's special coverage of the Iowa caucuses continues after this. Doors open throughout the state in just about an hour. We're here for all of it. Much more after this quick break. back to MSNBC's special coverage of the Iowa caucuses. I'm Jen Psaki. We're now one hour away from doors opening to the first nominating contest of the 2024 presidential election. Tonight, Republicans in the Hawkeye State will gather in local schools, churches, public libraries, and more to make their choice as to who will face President Joe Biden in the general election. If the latest polling is any indication, it probably won't be a close race for first place. Don't bet on that. The final NBC News Des Moines Register poll before tonight's action shows the twice impeached, four times indicted ex-president Donald Trump with the support of nearly one half of likely Republican caucus goers. A slight dip from polling last month, but still far and above the rest of his Republican opponents. Trump's former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley has 20 percent. She moved into second for the first time in this last poll. And she's followed by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis at 16 percent and entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy with 8 percent. Now, what is striking and could be a huge indication of what we'll see tonight is voter enthusiasm, because it all boils down to who actually shows up. I mean, the pool of people who vote in the Iowa caucus is small. The highest turnout ever was back in 2016, when just under 187,000 people showed up to caucus. That's a pretty small number of people in relative terms. So even small swings of who shows up could have a big impact on the outcome tonight. According to the latest polling, 49% of Trump supporters are extremely enthusiastic about voting for him, a stark difference from the 9% of Haley voters who say the same about voting for her. And voters will need enthusiasm because they're going to be battling Mother Nature tonight as they go out to vote. Temperatures in Iowa are sub-zero right now, as you've seen from every reporter who's outside. Wind chills could get as low as minus 45 degrees Fahrenheit. All of the candidates made their own versions of appeals to voters to come out despite the frigid weather. There's a little bit of a diversity of appeals. All right, it's caucus time. I know it's cold, but we need you out there. Wear some layers, bring your ID, and bring your friends. You're never going to have an opportunity where your vo voice and your vote is going to pack as much of a punch as it will tomorrow night. You can't sit home. If you're sick as a dog, you say, darling, I'm going to make it. Even if you vote and then pass away, it's worth it, remember? Even if you vote and then pass away, let's just sit with that for a second. Uh, that aside, there are actually big questions tonight about what the a outcome may say about the coalition of each candidate. I mean, does Trump sweep the evangelical vote? He had trouble with them just a couple years ago. Can Haley expand beyond her base of support among independents, Democrats, and never Trumpers? And can DeSantis, who put all of his eggs in the Iowa basket, do well enough to justify staying in the race. 
And what, if anything, does it mean for the race for the White House? This is just the beginning. We're going to dig into all of that and more tonight. And we're just getting started with special coverage. This hour, we are joined by a terrific panel. In a minute, former campaign manager for Barack Obama's 2012 re-election campaign, Jim Messina, will join us. Also with us, MSNBC political analyst, Democratic strategist, and president of Brilliant Corners Research, Cornell Belcher. Plus with me at the table, MSNBC political analyst, former Obama White House communications director, and co-host of MSNBC's How to Win 2024 podcast, Jennifer Palmieri. We just had your co-host on in the last hour, and writer at large for The Bulwark and MSNBC political analyst, Tim Miller. So let me start with both of you. There, there's, a, there's a lot to watch. I mean, I know Trump is leading by quite a bit. But Tim, what are you actually watching for tonight? Let's look at the results. I, I think how dominant Trump is tonight is the number one thing. Uh, what know, do you feel good about if you're his team? And I think if Trump's over 50, I, look, I think in the biggest possible picture, it is extremely alarming that somebody that, you know, attempted a coup is in this position and is going to be the nominee. So like that just stated, right? Now we're getting into Republican strategist brain <laughs> mode. And if, and if they get over 50, it's like, what is even the point of continuing past here, right? I mean, Donald Trump only had 24 la last time yeah. in Iowa, right? He'd be more than doubling what he did in 2016 when he won pretty easily. It's not like Ted Cruz was that close, right? So he went on to win the nomination quite easily. If he wins with 50 this time, this thing is basically cooked. So I, I think that's the number one thing to watch. Obviously, then the turnout numbers as we get to all these various caucuses, different parts of the state. You know, maybe Nikki Haley benefits from the fact that she's on the champagne track. You know, and that the, her fans' As cars. To the beer track, yeah, they is have that remote start. Yeah, her fans' cars have remote start. You know, they, it makes it easier for them to get out there. Uh, so <laughs> I think that she only has nine percent excited support, but she does have support from Maybe people that have seat heaters in their cars. Nice you, car. you could be like only nine nine percent like enthusiastic, but still show up. I think a lot of people aren't enthusiastic because they're Democrats. It doesn't mean they won't <laughs> show up, right? They're just like not necessarily enthusiastic about her at a fundamental level. It's true, but they still have to kind of get out of their door in freezing right, cold temperatures right. and be a Democrat and think this is worth my time doing that. Um, yeah. It isn't. People, I think I've also heard from people in Iowa that everybody's sort of like pent up and anxious to get out of their house. So. This is a big social outing at the church. It may be. The 50% thing is interesting because the last, if I'm correct here, the last person who came close to that, it was like 41%. I mean, nobody's ever come to 50%. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, 41 is the high with George w. W. And he only won by 10. So yes. Forbes had 31. So yes. I, you know, Trump, it, Trump's going to swap It would that. be significant. Okay. Steve Forbes. Steve wow. Forbes. I know. It's a throwback machine. We were just talking, and you and I kind of, well, all of us have like the communications brain you just yeah. can't unwrangle. Is it's all about sort of expectations and how you manage this. So, what's the biggest thing you're watching for post results? Okay, so tonight? the really hard thing for the campaigns to manage is how, how and when do you declare victory? Because as we all know, that doesn't mean winning, by the way, that means victory. <laughs> Declaring victory. And how you're defining I've it. I've had candidates declare victory in third place before, <laughs> so you never know. Well, in 2016, we, you know, it, because, because what people may not understand is, as I think people understand, the caucuses are very complicated, and results don't come rolling in at a, on a, a uniform clip, and you kind of have to sort of figure out, based on what kind of vote is outstanding and where it's outstanding, how your candidate is actually doing, and it is a race to declare victory. I'm sure Trump, who loves to declare victory, will do it, and he may even say, I've won with 50% of the vote, and we don't really know what it actually is. So Haley, I think, has the most on the line to try to be able to, decla to credibly declare second place, and at what point can she do that? And then the transition from Iowa to New Hampshire, like, you were just, like, so focused on Iowa for months and months and months, a year if you're Ron DeSantis, and then all of a sudden, boom, you got to be, you got to show up in New Hampshire, and you got to look like the winner. And if you don't do that transition right in the next 24 to 48 hours, you, you have to sink. fly overnight. I've been on a number of those oh, planes. Yeah. You don't sleep. You wake up and you're kind of in a, you're getting coffee at a diner at 5 a.m. It's very confusing. But you and have to And then the press that. is in your face about, like, <laughs> how are you going to win New yes. Hampshire? And New Hampshire voters, they give you, you got, like, 36 hours to turn it around. And it sneaks up. Even if you're really, you know, highly professional campaign, it sneak, that part sneaks up on it's you. It's such an important thing. Okay, Jim Messina, I think, has joined us. Um, and he, of course, has had many senior jobs on presidential campaigns that were actually winning. I actually was looking up, Jim. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was a sick burn to somebody. Um, Jim, I was looking up this morning. Just I forgot how large the turnout was for the for Barack Obama in 2000. It was 250,000 people, which is, if I'm correct, that is a huge, enormous number. What we're talking about now, I mean, record numbers for the Republicans was just under 187,000 in 2016. It's not 
seeming like it's going to be that. But talk to me a little bit about you have field. You can't unravel the field organizer from your brain and the political brain from you. H how those the turnout could impact the outcome here. Yeah, it's the most interesting question, right? Because lots of geeks like me are sitting in, in what we call boiler rooms, Jen, where they're running all the numbers right now, trying to figure out who's going to vote tonight. And to Tim's earlier point, is it the cities that are moving? How big is the rural turnout? If it's really big rural, you got to figure that helps Donald Trump. If it's a really massive turnout, that probably also helps Donald Trump. And so turnout is one of the biggest things. I remember in 2008 general election, I ran the boiler room on election day, and they came and said, huge problem. We have a mile-long line in Virginia with voters at 5 a.m. ready to vote. And I'm like, that's not a problem. That's called winning. And those are kind of the first things you see that are starting to tell you how big the turnout is going to be tonight. We're going to see it soon because these doors do open soon. Cornell, I'm going to come back to you, but we're first going to go to uh, NBC's Jacob Sovaroff, who's out in a super caucus location in Ottumwa, Iowa, for us. Um, get, he, you're going to give us a little tour of what's happening there. So talk to us about where you are, how this is going to work, what are you going to be watching? It would be my pleasure to give you a tour, Jen. I think if you want to know what's going to happen tonight and you want to know about turnout numbers, this is one of the places to look. This is Otumwa High School, and we're in Wapello County. Take a look at this auditorium. The way that it's all going to go down, Jen, is that everybody in this county, that's why they call it a super caucus site, there are 22 precincts here, are going to show up in this auditorium. But everybody's starting to gather downstairs. I'm going to take you through the whole building in a minute. But they're going to come up here. They're going to listen to the campaigns, make a pitch, and ultimately they're going to head outside of this auditorium, and then they're going to go to the caucus locations. Let me show you all of that. This place is pretty uh, impressive. It's about three, four stories tall. It's a building that dates to 1923. Uh, and everyone in this county, no matter where you're from, you're going to show up here tonight, 100 year anniversary of the Bulldogs, go Bulldogs. Uh, they're all going to show up here tonight and they're all going to make their way from the auditorium, believe it or not, down to the classrooms here on the second floor of the school. Uh, and let me show you where the caucuses themselves all take place. Because there are so many different precincts in the county, and when I said they're getting ready, they really are getting ready. You're getting ready for the caucus, right? Yes. What's your yeah. What's your name? Vicky. Vicky, and what do you do? I'm a custodian. Give me a hug. Thank you so much no. for getting ready for the caucus. We appreciate you. Yeah, not a problem. Okay, thanks I a lot, Vicky. So okay, keep coming, Jen. I'm going to show you the rest of this. We're Here with are the different you. Classrooms. We're following you. 120, 1, 121, 120. This one's a Spanish classroom uh, right here. Vicky, I just saw her here actually a few minutes ago. She was unlocking all the classrooms. People are going to bring their ballots into this room, uh, put their ballot, like a normal election with a secret ballot, inside a, a box, and they're going to actually count the ballots in these rooms. But this is not where the, the grand total is announced. I'm going to show you that, too. So, and the thing I want to point out, by the way, about Wapello County is that President Trump, former President Trump, uh, back in 2016, did quite well here. I think he had something like, see you in a minute. Don't worry. You can keep doing what you're doing. Uh, and back, what's that? Okay, we will, I promise. Um, back in... 2016, they had about 36 percent of the vote here. The question is, is it going to look more like the polls do? Is he going to get 50 percent of the uh, vote here, where, where there could be about as many as 1,000 people? They said there was 1,900 people here uh, in 2016. The weather, of course, by the way, outside, it's about negative uh, 11 degrees, actually. Oh, look, so, so here's the volunteers. They're starting to gather. Let's go down the stairs this way. Ultimately, once all those votes are tabulated, uh, they're going to be brought down here. And are you guys all caucus volunteers? Yep, just here to vote. Oh, are, so they're here real early. You guys are early bird. Yeah. Early bird catches I the worm. Five thirty, and I was ready to be here at six. Really? You all right, you better clear your jets. We're not, we're not starting until seven o'clock. Uh, they all start at seven here. But once it's all done, so it starts at seven upstairs. Uh, they're going to bring everything. That's eight o'clock Eastern time. They're going to bring everything down. Uh, they're going to tabulate the votes in those caucus locations. They're going to announce them on a big whiteboard here, and we'll know what's up in Wapello, hopefully around 9. Those will be unofficial results, but it'll be a good window into how President, former President Trump uh, is doing here, whether or not he increases that margin uh, or he stays around the same, decreases. I'm uh, just going to have to wait and see you guys. But it's, it, the excitement uh, is building slowly but surely as Vicky continues to unlock all the uh, caucus rooms upstairs. So interesting. I know, Jacob, you're going to give us lots of updates throughout the evening from there. And that's actually, as you just said, one of the bigger caucuses. This really shows people, people are gathering literally, as you are, at, at a local school, at churches. This is what is happening across Iowa every four years. I did want to ask you, I know, I know that you spoke with a bunch of Iowans ahead of tonight. Everybody's kind of obsessed, including us with the cold weather and how it's going to impact people. Did you get a sense it was going to deter anyone? 
Not really. Not really. And I mean, the thing about Iowa is this is Iowa. I don't know that it's always uh, this cold here, uh, negative 37 degrees with the wind chill. But people are dedicated. And actually, to be perfectly honest with you, in this county, people are very passionate about Donald Trump, irrespective of sort of the controversies around all of his policies in the last uh, administration. We talk, I've talked details about immigration, about the economy, about how people's lives are here. Uh, and people are still steadfast supporters of the former president about his legal troubles. Uh, they say they're going to come out anyways. And I think for many of them, that's part of the reason they want to make this extra effort uh, to come out. Uh, and, and I mean, they're, they're not kidding around. I, I have a feeling that we are going to see a pretty good crowd here. I mean, these guys are early and they're what? Like, uh, you know, they, we got hours to go before this thing begins. It's what you're telling me is that we are a little wimpy here on the East Coast and our tolerance for weather and people just put their boots on their coats and they get out to caucus jacob so thank you so much for uh, starting us off this hour please stay it, warm uh cornell let me go to you i mean you are as we all like to say an actual pollster so maybe you're going to bring us down to earth on some of these numbers i mean jacob touched on this um just kind of how in in recent polls trump says crazy things he echoes hitler he says he's going to be a dictator uh, more than six in ten likely republican caucus goers 61 percent say it doesn't matter uh to their support if former president trump is convicted that was in the recent des moines register poll what does that tell? I mean, when you hear those numbers, you think, what is happening? Is this the country we live in? But what does that tell us about, I guess, the Republican electorate? But how do you think about that as it relates to the electorate writ large in November? Well, a, a couple of things. One is he clearly has a locked in base of support, right? And it's and he said it himself. He could shoot someone. Uh, and not losing his support, and, 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 and it's true, right? It only energizes his, his base of support. What I will say is that when, when the horse race number is wrong, uh, it's usually because the pollster has predicted the wrong universe. And it all depends on what universe turns out. And as you've pointed out there, you're talking about such a narrow swath of voters anyway. A high point for Republicans, I think, was, was what, 187,000 votes. So you're talking about such a narrow swath, a narrow universe of voters to, to start with, and, you got, and you've got sort of terrible conditions there. So it's about who turns out. And this is where polling gets tricky and, and, and where polling can be off, at least on a horse race number, which I think we spend too much time talking about anyway, it is when the universe is wrong. And I got to tell you, it's hard to predict that caucus universe <laughs> in, in, in Iowa. And it's hard to predict that universe in, in New Hampshire, too, because you have people, independents who can come and go in and out of that uni in and out of that universe. So it's hard to predict. So I, I, I won't lean too much on that horse race number. But that said, it, even if the universe is off, uh, it's usually not all 20 or 30 points. Uh, so it's hard to see, right? So, I, I, you know, I think Trump is a front runner there. But what I'm really looking at here is, look, no one has spent more resources, burnt through more cash, and, and, and set, you know, put more into Iowa than, than DeSantis. And the truth of the matter is, if, if Trump, I hope Trump doesn't get to 50%, because then it becomes inevitable. I mean, I think he has this, this feeling of inevitability and which which trickles down to the other to other states. But I think if Trump does get close to 50, given all the time and the effort and the resources that DeSantis has spent in this in Iowa, I think it's hard to justify sort of from a resource standpoint, from a campaign standpoint, how he moves forward. So I think Iowa is actually probably going to slim down the field uh, realistically here in the next couple of days. No one's going anywhere. All of you are staying put. Thank you for that. And when we return, the all-important evangelical vote in Iowa, which, by the way, it's a Cornell's point, Ron DeSantis has been betting on and still isn't winning. Uh, but why, unlike eight years ago, they're much more likely to support Donald Trump? Plus, we'll be joined by the one and only Steve Kornacki, what he's watching for tonight. He'll bring us his viewer's guide to tonight's caucuses, live as always from the big board. And later, more developments in the many, many legal troubles facing the disgraced ex-president and Iowa caucus's favorite. What we're learning about how Jack Smith plans to prosecute Trump for his mishandling of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. That's also still happening. Our special coverage of the Iowa caucuses continues after a short break. Stay with us. Um, I've noticed in the past few years that, like, like almost every person I've met, like, supports him and there's so many people that support him and I see his uh, his name his signs more often than I've ever seen any other candidates 
That was NBC's Priscilla Thompson talking to a first-time Iowa caucus goer in Sioux County about the growth and support he's seen for Donald Trump compared to 2016, when Trump lost the Iowa caucuses to Senator Ted Cruz. And that county, an evangelical stronghold, can tell us a lot about why Trump's polling in Iowa overall is much stronger now. Because back in 2016, it was Trump's worst performing county in the state. He came in fourth, losing every precinct, largely due to his weak support with evangelical voters. A lot has changed since then, though. I mean, not for the good for Trump, necessarily. Uh, Trump has been, well, he's been married three times. That was before then. But he's been indicted for, owned casinos, promoted gambling, had an affair with a porn star, been credibly accused of sexual assault by more than 25 women, and bragged about it on tape. Some of that happened before that, but that's all part of Trump's record. This is the leading, and he's now leading the GOP field by nearly 30 points with evangelical caucus goers, according to a new poll from NBC News. And it's because Trump has aligned his own values more with the evangelical community. He hasn't become more evangelical. As you just heard in that clip, it is because more people in the evangelical community seem to have lined their values to his. So let's bring in NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson in Sioux Center, Iowa. Priscilla, you've been talking to voters there. You just We just had a great clip we just played of one you spoke with. Talk to us a little bit about President Trump's support there, which is, seems to be such a shift from 2016. Uh, yeah, Jen, certainly. And we've been crisscrossing this county, talking to caucus goers, trying to get a sense of what's happened here. And what I'll say is that of the folks that I've talked to, a lot of them have told me that they were undecided but leaning towards Trump. And so it's perhaps not that super firm support that we're seeing in some other areas, but it's a number of issues that is driving it. Some folks, for them, it is abortion and the fact that he sort of paved the way for overturning Roe v. Wade. But I've also heard about immigration, certainly about the economy and also about just holding government agencies accountable. But the one thing that I have heard from folks across the board is that they feel like they know Donald Trump. They know what they're getting with him. They know that he was going to follow through and do what it is he said he was going to do. Ron DeSantis has also spent a lot of time in this county trying to drum up that evangelical uh, vote. But what I've heard from caucus goers is that they're not sure that they know him. They're not sure they know what they're getting with him. But with Trump, they have seen it over the past four years. They have seen how he has delivered for them. And for that reason, a lot of folks are looking towards supporting him at tonight's caucus. Jen? So you mentioned a number of issues there, which is, is very interesting for people to pay attention to and focus on. It seems like they're kind of ignoring what's going on and has gone on in his personal life and how that aligns or doesn't align, should I say, with traditional evangelical beliefs, as well as all of these legal cases against them, which are, of course, different. But is that sort of a sentiment you're hearing, that none of that matters to them? Yeah, it is not something that has come up in my conversations with those folks. There are some people who said, well, I'm on the fence because of the legal issues and some of the baggage that he brings, but that is not outweighing their support. And it's important to note, in 2016, it was a completely different story. As you mentioned, this was the county where Donald Trump performed the worst. Ted Cruz won this county. He went on to win the state. And I asked a caucus goer who says he's going to support Nikki Haley tonight about that. I said, what has changed in this community? And I I want to play what he told me. What's changed? What's changed is that the evangelical Christians have bought, and by the way, I consider myself one, uh, have, have come to the point where they believe that Donald Trump is speaking their kind of issues. They think they need somebody that can take on the, quote, libs, and so they, they've sold out. Yeah, Priscilla. And I will say that is a sentiment that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Priscilla. You were just explaining no, your clip. I was you say, go forward. <laughs> yes, no, that is a sentiment that I've heard from mm. folks here in the evangelicals. They want a fighter. He's a fighter. They're tired of being run over. Whereas you heard that caucus goer who also identifies as evangelical, and he told me, no, my religion is about inclusivity. It's about uh, supporting the immigrant and helping those who need that assistance. And so there's definitely a misalignment, I think, in how some people are viewing their religion uh, right now. And so he's going to be caucusing for Nikki Haley, hoping to give her a boost. But he says Trump is like, going to win here by a mile and that's a quote jen 
Priscilla Thompson, such an important, you're in a very important county uh, paying attention to this. It's definitely one to watch tonight about such an important issue, which is the evangelical community and where they go. Thank you for your excellent reporting and for joining us as well this afternoon. So we're back with Jim, Cornell, Jen, and Tim. Okay, Tim, you've promised me during the break you had a lot of thoughts on the evangelical community. So give us really your thoughts. Raised expectations. I you do, really I do raised a little bit. Then, but live. then I was jarred by hearing a senior citizen talk about owning the libs. Uh, you know, and that is like to put me in a very dark place about the state of affairs uh, among the Republican electorate. Look, th that was such an important report for Priscilla yeah. because that area, Sioux County, Sioux Center, like if DeSantis was going to have a good night, it would be there. That needs to be it, yes. right? And I remember in 08 working for McCain, and you know that was like hostile territory for us, right? That was Mike Huckabee land. Like it was just McCain just didn't offer kind of that true religious values, you know, Christian conservatism, Pat Buchanan, you know, excuse me, Pat Robertson style policies that these voters like. But so that should be DeSantis's room, right? Like they went, they went Huckabee up there, they went Santorum, they went Ted Cruz. And now DeSantis is nowhere. I just think that speaks to the weakness of his candidate skills and his grassroots skills, right? I, I think the fact is that they spent a hundred million and they yeah. spent like thousands of dollars per voter in Iowa and he can't he can't just rustle up. He needs to rustle up a thousand voters, up, you know, in a county like that. But he can't find them because they've decided they like Donald Trump better. That's just the reality. Or that he's not going to win. Yeah. I mean, one of the things we may be talking about later this evening is just endorsements and whether they matter. I oh mean, Ron DeSantis has, they've never really mattered, in my view, just to put my cards on the table. Not for but, the last 20 years, I mean, least. but Bob Vanderplatz is one of the most influential. There are other influential, but he's one of the most influential evangelical leaders in Iowa. He endorsed DeSantis pretty early. Governor he also, Reynolds endorsed DeSantis. Governor That's Reynolds endorsed part of the DeSantis. State. She's still saying he's going to win as of a few days ago, so there's that. But talk to me a little bit about that, because it's like every cycle well, think, we kind of I mean, think it like, matters. Yeah, but it matters when, it, it can matter when you have an untested candidate that people don't know well and they mm -hmm. need somebody else to vouch for them, right? Donald Trump doesn't need anybody to vouch for them. And, the, you know, the caucuses itself, the caucuses were devised decades ago to be a way for the Republican Party and Democratic Party to ferret out the best person to win across the country, right? Donald Trump blew up that whole system eight years ago. So it's, you know, all of these sort of niceties of endorsements and managing expectations in Iowa, it's kind of, you know, these people are playing an old game. But what I think people don't understand about evangelicals when, when I've been in Iowa and talked to them, Donald Trump delivered for mm -hmm. them in such a big way. He did, I mean, and Priscilla said that he did what he said he was going to do. And they do not expect, evangelicals do not expect politicians to be saints. There's a lot of sin in the world. They expect people to, they, they don't expect great behavior from politicians. So it is not necessarily at odds for them to get behind someone like Trump and an earthly figure like Trump who delivered, who-, who Earthly who, is a very <laughs> right? diplomatic is, way of saying it. Can I give one yeah. small silver lining to all this? Like, isn't the worst thing in the world that the evangelical grifter uh, you know, uh, complex is now dead in Iowa, right? I mean, like, that was yeah. it in 04 and 08, right? You, you mean get the leaders the, don't have the influence. Yeah, you get did. Bob Vanderplantz and Steve Scheffler, like, you it was get those all, people on board, board and then everybody and else then, comes. Right, right, and that right. just doesn't work now anymore. Now it's like, and people aren't even listening to them within the community. So, Jim, I, I just wanted to kind of jump ahead. We have Iowa to cover tonight, but evangelicals in the Republican primary are important, right? They're not really a big presence in New Hampshire, but if you're the... DeSantis team and you can't do well with them, what argument do you make and how much could this support because he delivered, as Palmieri just said, help Trump in kind of states between now and leading up to Super Tuesday? Oh, look, if DeSantis can't move tonight, I mean, he's bet his entire campaign on this. This was supposed to be good ground for him. And if he can't finish a strong second, his goose is cooked and he won't make it to South Carolina or other places where where evangelical voters are very, very important, including Super Tuesday. I mean, he finishes third tonight and it's over for him. But a reminder to what Tim said, you know, Iowa Republicans have been in the past 15 years really poor predictors of who's going to be a good general election candidate. And, you know, the guy you interviewed talked to him about, well, these voters trust him. They know him. They feel comfortable with him. That's exactly the opposite, Jen, of what uh, voters in the battleground states say in focus groups. They are so sick of the Trump bandwagon. They're so sick of what he says every day. They don't feel comfortable with him. So the Iowa Republicans got to be really careful what they're doing tonight because they're probably going to put this guy on the road to the nomination. And I still believe he's not going to win the job. 
general election. So let, let's talk about that. First of all, his goose is cooked is quite a turn of phrase we may reuse this evening. We'll see. Um, Cornell, you, you again are an actual poster who's, who's sat in these focus groups. You've run them. You've looked at data. Talk to us a little bit about how these Trump arguments impact people in focus groups. Are they sick of it? I'm talking about independent, not, not hardcore Democrats, independents and others who are going to be important in the larger electorate as we move forward. Yeah, well, one thing I, I want us to understand, you can't take, and I know we do it all the time, but you can't take too much out of what happens in primaries or caucuses and project them at large around the general uh, general electorate, because like general uh, election, because as you just talked about, it's such a narrow swath of voters in the first in the first place. We look we, in this country, we're lucky if we get 50 percent of voters turning out. So you're talking about what maybe 10, 8, 9 percent of voters determining who who wins a primary or caucus. So it's, it's, it's a narrow it's a narrow swath. What I will say is that it, it is a it is a target-rich environment with with, with with Donald Trump, and part of the problem is is it's it's flooding the box is you know how do you pick the best arguments against him because there are some good arguments against him that move independent vo independent voters look when i think about this the general election i think it's going to come down to a large part it's going to come out of turnout but it's and 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 the president's ability to coalesce that obama continuum around him again like we saw it deteriorate in 2016 to third party voting and, and not turning out but it coalesced around him in 20 and 2020 with this young diverse uh, group of voters and younger voters sort of coalescing around him and taking him across the finish line but i think it, it comes down to sort of what are these younger more diverse voters going to do but also from an argument standpoint look i think it is i think i, I agree with jim i, I I think Donald Trump is, has a ceiling of 47, 46 percent. We've seen this in several elections. It's hard for him to get above that that ceiling, given what you just said about him getting. He's he's been he's been indicted. He's got civil assault uh, uh, lawsuit against him. He's played he's paid off porn stars. So there's a lot of arguments for uh, against him. And look, it, it, when you look, when you talk to that 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 swing voter, that 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 mom in in suburban Philadelphia, or that mom in the suburbs outside of Atlanta, who will who will largely determine this election, it's hard for us to to, to, to put out the argument. You know, how does Trump move that woman voter, that college-educated white woman voter in the suburbs, back towards him and the Republicans? And we've seen them. Republicans, we've seen the deterioration of the suburbs over the last couple of years. How does he? How does that? How does that mom who's thinking about her daughter and her daughter's ability to have a better life and decide what happens to her body, and 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 college debt? You know, how does Trump and Republicans pull those voters back? So I, I agree with Jim. I think is, I think is a, it's tough to see him get over that 46, 47 percent. But I think the, the 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 call and the rally of the Biden campaign is how do they pull. Pull, got back this 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 younger, more diverse uh, uh, electorate and coalesced around him. One one quick thing I, I got to say about evangelicals. I want to level set a little bit here. I know we spent a lot of time talking about evangelicals, but what you're largely talking about here is white evangelicals. Mm -hmm. And religiosity takes people of color in a very different direction than it does take uh, uh, whites. You show me someone who's in tr church frequently, you know, two or three times a week, and and, and is white. I'm probably going to show you a Republican. Uh, a Trump supporter. However, if you show me someone who's who's African American in church two or three times a week, I'm probably going to show you someone who's voting in a Democratic primary. So religiosity takes people in very different places, and it's a complicated conversation. That's such an important point. And Iowa, as we all know, this is why it's not first for the Democrats anywhere. Is 80? Well, it's 85 percent uh, white in the Republican electorate, or 85 percent white, maybe in general. But uh, that is a very important point. One I'm sure we'll be talking more about. Everyone is sticking around. When we return, it's not an election night without Steve Kornacki. At least that's what. Everyone on my friend's text chains tell me. So he'll be joining us with a look at what he's watching for tonight. Our coverage of the Iowa caucuses continues right after this. We are now just about a half hour away from when doors open at caucus sites around Iowa. The first actual votes of the 2024 presidential race coming a bit later this evening. And the man who will be taking us through all of it tonight for many hours to come and all year long is NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki, who joins us now from the big board with a look at what he's watching for tonight. Okay, Steve, what are we watching for tonight? Yeah, well, we'll uh, take you to the map that will begin filling up sometime after 8 o'clock Eastern. By the way, the first vote reports from the 
Iowa Republican caucuses the last time around in 2016, just to give you a little sense. 8.36 Eastern time, 7.36 Iowa time, we got our first report, so maybe file that one away for tonight. So this map will be filling in, but in terms of what, you know, 99 counties here, what are we going to be looking for in them? Let me give you a few different ideas, and I think we'll use 2016 here sort of as a guidepost here in, in splitting up the state. So remember, first of all, obviously, Trump lost Iowa in 2016. Ted Cruz beat him by three points, and Marco Rubio was only a point behind Trump. He almost beat Trump for second place. Now, why did Ted Cruz win Iowa and uh, Donald Trump didn't in 2016. One word, you were just talking about it. Evangelicals. Uh, they made up 64% of the Iowa Republican electorate in 2016. Uh, and the, the formula here in modern Iowa caucuses has been you win the evangelical vote, you win the caucuses. That's how Mike Huckabee did it in 2008, Rick Santorum in 2012, Ted Cruz over Donald Trump in 2016. So, with that in mind, there are 42 counties of these 99 that voted for all three of the candidates I just mentioned, the evangelical candidates Huckabee, Santorum, and Cruz, 42 of the 99. So we're going to be keying in on those early. Um, almost all the, the sort of very, very dark red you see on the map, these are all the Cruz counties, the very dark red. Most of them fit that criteria. He won some counties that weren't Huckabee and Santorum as well, but most of these fit that Huckabee, Santorum, Cruz. Uh, none maybe more dramatically than Sioux County in the northwest part of the state. Deeply, deeply religious here. And you see Cruz won it, but the thing you don't see is Donald Trump's name here. Donald Trump got 11% of the vote in Sioux County. This is the ninth largest in terms of votes produced uh, on caucus night. Donald Trump was 11%. This was his worst county in the state. Remember in 2016, there was a lot of skepticism, resistance to him among evangelicals. The story of the last year, eight years, that seems to have changed. Sioux County will tell us a lot about that story tonight. Is Trump winning here? How much is he winning by? Is it a runaway? Those are the sorts of things we're going to be looking for. Those 42 counties. Uh, they were uh, uh, Huckabee, uh, Santorum, and Cruz. How many of them is Trump flipping over? And conversely, if DeSantis is going to make any noise tonight, going to surprise anyone, look as well to those 42 counties. Is he winning any of them? Is he winning a bunch of them? Is he close to Trump in a bunch of them? The better he does, those are core counties for him because he's going after the evangelical vote so hard in this campaign. So we're going to look closely at those. Another type of county, the other big type of county to keep an eye on, far, far fewer of these, but everything you see sort of, whatever you want to call this color, is it pink? Is it cream? Is it salmon? I I'm, I'm almost colorblind. I can't quite tell. But anyway, whatever you want to call this color here, and there are five counties, and they were all won by Marco Rubio. The thing these five counties have in common, they got big populations, at least within Iowa. These are some of the biggies. Polk County, where Des Moines is, is the biggest. About 17% of the caucus vote is going to come out of there. Now, what did Marco Rubio have in 2016? Let me go back to the full state result. Marco Rubio's voters tended to be college educated. They tended to be higher income. They tended to live in urban areas or suburban areas. That is what defines these five counties here. This is a big bedroom uh, suburb, bedroom, bedroom community suburb of Des Moines. Dallas County, Rubio won it. Trump was far behind. How about Story County? This is one of Trump's worst in the state. Only 50 15% Rubio in a runaway. This is where Iowa State University is. This is where Ames is. So again, Nikki Haley, like Rubio, attracting higher income, college educated, urban, suburban voters. So if Nikki Haley is going to make noise tonight, get second, get the kind of momentum out of Iowa she's looking for, look for it in Polk. Look for it in Dallas County. Whoa, I didn't mean to move the map there. Look for it in Dallas County. Look for it in Story County. Right here, Johnson County. This is the biggest Democratic county in the state in general elections, but it's where Iowa City is, the University of Iowa. It still produces a good number of votes on the Republican side. This was Rubio territory in 16. Is it Haley territory tonight? So those are the, some keys we're going to be looking at. Evangelical counties that resisted Trump in 2016 and went for Ted Cruz. Is Trump turned it completely around there, or is DeSantis giving him a run for his money in some of those? And those suburban, urban counties, college degrees, higher uh, uh, incomes, is Nikki Haley running up big margins there that might get her to second place, that might get a surprise showing for her? And again, Trump did poorly in those counties as well. Has he improved at all? One, one of the questions, Stephen, you've talked about this, I have, is about what will show Nikki Haley has expanded her coalition. And you mentioned some of these very big counties, Polk, where Des Moines is, Story County, uh, Lynn County, where college, college campuses are, Johnson County. Where are the places you might be watching to see, even though the population is small, if she does better than expected there? It might be an indication she might be having a good night. 
Yeah, so and this is the challenge for Haley, I think even just from a message standpoint, because we just found it in our last poll, more than three quarters of her voters say they have a negative view of Donald Trump. Half of her voters in our poll identify as either independents or Democrats. And I think not coincidentally in our poll, her unfavorable, unfavorable rating spiked pretty dramatically. This is something we've seen in Republican politics in the Trump era. Think of Chris Christie. Think of Mike Pence. The more you get sort of uh, uh, seen as the candidate of the anti-Trump vote, the anti-Trump forces, the more that Republicans who like Donald Trump, and that is the vast majority of Republicans, will turn on you. That might be happening to Nikki Haley. If she wants to put that to bed tonight, it's not just doing well in those places I talked about. Some places you might look, southern uh, Iowa here along the Missouri border, because I just used Marco Rubio in 2016 as an example. Take a look at how Rubio did in some of these counties in 2016. Uh, start right here. Again, you don't see his name. Ben Carson got third here. Rubio, these are rural areas, lower income, lower college degree concentration, and Rubio just wasn't even registering. Just go right across. Ben Carson in third, no Rubio. Ben Carson in third, no Rubio. Ben Carson in third, no Rubio. So this is what tripped Rubio up in 2016. If he'd shown a pulse in these rural counties, I'm showing you some examples of, he could have passed Trump and got second place. He might have even been able to beat Ted Cruz in 2016, but he absolutely fell flat in those places. The polling we're seeing indicates that Nikki Haley is not going to do that much better. If she does, that would be a surprise. That would indicate an expansion of her base away from just non-Republicans, away from Trump skeptical voters, to more of the core Trump-era Republican base. And that would be an interesting development, and certainly one her campaign, I think, would welcome and would make a lot of noise about it if they could get it. And Steve, are you able to, I mean, in your polling, you track uh, if people voted for Trump in 16, if they voted for Trump in 2020 in the general election, are we going to be able to discern or how quickly will we we'll be able to discern if Trump is actually expanding his universe of voters, if people who are voting for him this time that didn't vote for him last time, particularly yeah, I mean, we're just, in the uh, suburban counties? Yeah, because every that county, as we get results... I'll just show you right now what we're going to do. Go back out to the statewide level. And again, I mean, we'll go to the biggest county. Let's just say we got results out of Polk County to start the night here. You, 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 what we'll do, actually, I'm going to go over two tonight's. That might make this all easier. So go to the 2024 screen. is blank now. Let's say we get results from Polk County. Every county we get them, we're going to compare. How did it look in 2016? And, you know, here's Polk's number for Trump. He was at 22%. He was in third place. You know, if he's doing massively better than that tonight, that'll be a story. If he's only doing incrementally better, that'll be its own story. We're going to start looking for trends that way. Certainly, we expect Trump to be improving pretty much across the board on his 2016 showing. The question is how much. The polls are indicating it's going to be massive improvement, basically a little more than doubling his support based on our final poll uh, in, every, in any given county. Is he actually doing that? Is he coming in short of that? Is he exceeding that? But we'll have those numbers as they come, and that's going to be a major point of comparison for us. A huge point. Polk County, always important to watch. Steve Kornacki wouldn't be an election night without you, I think it's fair to say. Jen Palmieri, Tim Miller, Jim Messina, and Cornell Belcher, thank you all for spending some time with us this afternoon. And when we return, we're keeping our eye on Iowa, of course, for the rest of the night. But there's a lot to get into in the prosecutions of Donald Trump. New developments in both the Mar-a-Lago case and Fulton County. We'll have those right after a short break. And what is just another reflection of this wild and crazy ride we're all on this year that includes a historic presidential race overlapping, sometimes within days, with Trump's many legal cases? Brand new court filings late Friday night lay out, for the first time, the specific witnesses that special counsel Jack Smith plans to have testify in the classified documents case against him. So six FBI employees who are described in these new documents filed by the special counsel as experts in digital forensics, cellular or computer analytics are expected to testify about extracted data erased from devices and accounts belonging to Trump's co-defendants. His body man, Walt Nada, still his body man, remarkably, and Mar-a-Lago property manager, Carlos de Oliveira, as well as data related to the unnamed Trump employee number two. Joining our conversation, former acting assistant attorney general for national security at the DOJ and co-host of MSNBC's excellent podcast, Prosecuting Donald Trump, Mary McCord is here. And with me at the table, state attorney for Palm Beach County, Florida, David Ehrenberg. So let me start with you, because um, there's so many filings that are happening. But this one on Friday night seems pretty interesting and important because it tells us a little bit about the strategy. What should we take away from it? Obstruction. 
because Donald Trump apparently instructed his men, Walt Nada and Carlos de Oliveira, to delete an important recording. Mm -hmm. And there's some evidence. See, people lie, but the recordings don't. And the uh, cell phones There are tapes, don't. which is an evergreen statement. Yeah. Already there are tapes. And that is going to be Trump's undoing in this case. It's a shame, though, that the strongest case, which is, which is this one, is going to be the one least likely to occur before the election because Judge Cannon is slow walking. So it. you don't think this is going to start in May? No way. Judge Cannon has given Donald Trump's team all the deference in the world. She has pushed back all the deadlines you would normally have had already. And in so doing, the case that will be heard that Trump's most worried about will be in Washington, D.C., the election interference case. But this is the strongest case, and this one's not happening. Well, oh, it's, it's a little dark. I, I, Mary, there's, there's always so much going on on the legal front, as, as is true every time we talk. But um, I wanted to ask you about what we've seen over the last couple of days with reporting around Fonnie Willis, because, of course, there was some uh, a report in the Atlanta Journey, Journal Constitution that started out. It was about a filing from the Trump team against her. She came out this weekend and spoke to it for the first time. And she called out what she calls racially motivated attacks against her by Trump allies about her choice to pick Nathan Wade as one of three lead prosecutors. Let's listen to that, and then I want to get your take. Dear God, I do not want to be like those that attack me. I never want to be a Marjorie Taylor Greene, who has never met me. I appointed three special counsel, as is my right to do. First thing they say, oh, she gonna play the race card now. But no God, isn't it them who's playing the race card when they only question one? She didn't, of course, I should note, speak to the specific accusations filed by the Trump team in what she said, but what do, what do you make of the story, of her response, of, of how it could impact or not impact what's happening in Georgia? Well, first, just to be clear, this was a filing by Mike Roman. This was not by uh, the former president. Yes, Donald important Trump clarification. Thank you, Mary. Yes. Yeah. And I partly mention that because even Donald Trump's own attorneys have not yet decided yet whether they're even going to join in this request by Mike Roman for the case to be completely dismissed, in part because they want to make a determination for themselves whether there's any merit to it. And that's pretty amazing when you think about it, because Trump's out there tweeting about it, but his own attorney is saying, hold yeah. on, we don't even know if we want to join this. But this is really, it's really about trying to make an argument that because Fannie Willis exercising authority that she has uh, contracted with a special counsel, paid that special counsel, and then the allegations are that they have a personal relationship and that the special counsel using money, now I don't know how they'd know what money was used for what since money is fungible, but using money uh, as part of the proceeds of his contract with the DA's office funded vacations that the two of them went on. And this is the basis for seeking his disqualification. I will say, number one, none of that has anything to do with sort of the merits of the criminal cases against Mr. Roman or any of the other uh, 19, you know, defendants in that RICO case, four of whom have pleaded guilty already. Uh, and we have to wait till we see Fonnie Willis's actual response in court, because she didn't get into the merits of this, just said that she would be responding in order to really assess if there's any problem here ethically under the Georgia rules of professional responsibility. But regardless of what, if there are any ethical issues, and again, there's so many facts unknown, regardless of that, it certainly doesn't undermine the merits of the criminal case. Mary McCord and Dave Ehrenberg. I should also know she is one of many people who's been the target of swatting calls as well. So there's just a lot happening in these legal cases. Thank you both for spending some time with us this afternoon. Doors are open uh, at, or about to open, I should say, minutes from now at caucus sites around Iowa. Those caucuses getting underway in about two hours from now. Our special coverage will continue right after a short break. Welcome to MSNBC's special coverage of tonight's Iowa caucus. I'm Ari Melber here with Jen Psaki for the next hour. Great to be here. As we count down to the caucus and results coming in later tonight with candidates making their final pushes, here's what they have to say. Today is the day we make history because we tune out the noise of the media. Do you guys know anybody who is going to caucus for Haley or DeSantis? Yes, I do. Yes. And I'm going to try to... You can't sit home, even if you vote and then pass away. It's worth it. You can be the most worthless Republican in America, 
But if you kiss the ring, he'll say you're wonderful. I like DeSantis because he has a excellent record of service. What do you think about when people say, well, I was still Trump country? I think that's wrong. Some Iowans, as you just heard, pushing back on efforts to script tonight's story before voters weigh in, which will happen in the next few hours. While Trump does have a lead in the final poll, with Haley rising, and that lead is larger than Trump's polling lead in 2016, which did not help him avoid starting that year with a loss. We have more on that later this hour in the first joint special report that we've ever done. That's uh, true. That's right. And then the other factor uh, that could upend tonight, freezing temperatures, Iowa down negative 35 degrees. That's freaking very cold. Extremely. Count, <laughs> counting wind chill, wind chill and scenes like what you see in your screen. Water turning into snow in midair. Well, I will say burr. We're warm here. Yeah, we're a little warmer than being out there. We're also seeing people facing the cold as the lines begin going into caucus sites tonight. So we're watching all of that and joining us now is someone who knows a thing or two about the Iowa caucus, Howard Dean, former Democratic presidential candidate who competed there and ran the DNC and served as Vermont governor. Uh, thanks for joining Jen and I. What is the most important thing to understand in your view about the Iowa caucus going into tonight? Uh, it does set the stage, but it doesn't eliminate people, uh, with the exception of DeSantis. If DeSantis finishes after Nikki Haley, uh, that's going to happen, in, and I think uh, pretty clear it's going to happen in New Hampshire. That probably will do in DeSantis. Other than that, um, the other question is how big will Trump's margin be? And if he gets below 50, then I think he's got a problem. And if he gets a lot below 50, then he has an enormous problem. Hmm. Governor, you've, you've, been, you've made your name for yourself in many ways. One of them is running a 50-state strategy for the Democratic Party. Well, one of the things I'm interested in watching is kind of where candidates surprise people in this state tonight, or if they surprise people. So where will you be watching to see if, say, Nikki Haley's coalition is expanded beyond Democrats, uh, never Trump Republicans and independents? What will you be looking at? Uh, I'm, well, that's a hard one. Uh, I, certainly, Iowa is one. Trump has a huge advantage there. Uh, people haven't campaigned. Nikki Haley hasn't campaigned until recently there. Um, New Hampshire probably if, uh, is like the is more like the American electorate than Iowa is. Uh, it's a it's a it's te theoretically it's a purple state, uh, although it hasn't been voting that way uh, as the Republican Party has moved to the far right because most of the Republicans in Iowa, are, I mean in New Hampshire, are not far right. Um, it's very hard to say where the first real contest will be because it totally depends on what happens tonight and then the next week in New Hampshire. Yeah, and as you say, Governor, the sort of the reaction and the narrative and the money, which is what candidates need to keep going, uh, can react to all of those sort of perception pieces. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Republican Party in Iowa has been seen basically finding an evangelical base for Trump, uh, which is not what they, evangelicals, would have said they wanted in 15 14, any time before the magnification of the party. Take a look at, at some reporting here on that point. 2016, this county went for Ted Cruz. What's changed? What's changed is that the evangelical Christians have bought, and by the way, I consider myself one, uh, have, have come to the point where they believe that Donald Trump is speaking their kind of issues they think they need somebody that can take on the quote libs and so they, they've sold out they've sold out i want to be clear governor that's the view of an iowa self-described evangelical conservative um, who disagrees with what he sees as kind of an evangelical um selling out to trump well, it is. I mean, Trump is the farthest thing from an evangelical Christian, in fact, the farthest thing from a Christian in terms of his own professed values, how he treats women, how he uh, treats other people, his willingness to say whatever he wants, whether it's true or not. I mean, these are hardly what most Christians would call Christian values. So in, in many ways, the danger here is that the evangelical Christians have abandoned any pretense of being ethical. Uh, and they're just doing this because Trump is their vehicle uh, to their vision of how the, what they'd like to impose on the rest of us in the United States. So I, I don't know w what to make of all this. this Iowa is not a typical state, uh, but it does have an influence because it's the first, and it does reflect how well you can organize it in the state. 
Uh, so, Governor, one of the other things that's been striking to me, and you've spent a lot of time in Iowa yourself, is... All kind of 99 what, counties. 99 counties, very well aware, quite a lot of stops, is, you know, some of the polls have showed that some of the things that Donald Trump has said about echoing Hitler, talking about vermin, are, are supported by, uh, by Iowa caucus goers, or they are according to the polls. Did that surprise you? And what does it tell you yeah, about the electorate? It really is. Uh, Iowa has changed a lot. Uh, I, I've been somewhat shocked. Uh, Iowa used to have, and maybe maybe it still does, uh, one of the highest uh, collective board scores uh, on the SATs, very high educational attainment. To a lot of very good small universities there, in addition to the state universities, which are very good. I don't know what's happened to Iowa. I, I am shocked. Uh, it was always a swing state, and it isn't anymore. So there's some bitterness. There's some anger. Maybe the evangelicals have made more progress. But something's happened in Iowa. I, I frankly, I hate to say this because I'm incredibly fond of Iowa because it's a lot like Vermont in some ways. Uh, but they really shouldn't be the first for uh, the Democrats. They don't reflect what the rest of America looks like at all, and they certainly don't reflect uh, what the Democratic Party looks like. So I think it was a wise decision for the Democrats not to go to Iowa first. Yeah, huge surge in registered Republicans since over the last couple of years there, no question. Governor Dean, thank you so much for joining us with your amazing book collection behind you. And joining us now from Iowa is Asa Hutchinson, running for president and on the GOP ballot tonight. The former Arkansas governor has been an outspoken Trump critic throughout the campaign. He has redefined uh, the Republican Party, and not in a good way. And uh, whenever you look at what I'm trying to do is draw attention to the fact that Donald Trump is a, a weak candidate for us. Long-term fear, uh, fear-mongering, and grievances only take you so far. Governor Hutchinson, uh, you have been a strong critic of Trump, never held back uh, on that front. What does a good night look for like for you tonight? Well, you have to beat expectations uh, here in Iowa. And, of course, uh, I've taken a uh, tough route here in the campaign, being clear uh, that we need to move a different direction than Donald Trump. In fact, I'm the only candidate campaigning in Iowa for president that didn't has not promised a pardon to Donald Trump if they're elected. And that's a fundamental distinction. Now, that cost me some votes uh, that points out uh, that I think for myself and that I'm looking out for our judicial system in America. But I want to exceed expectations. I'm not going to define that for you. But as Howard said, you got to get some bump out of here to make sure you can raise money for the next contest in New Hampshire. And I really believe we can do that because this campaign is going to go on not just Iowa, New Hampshire, but uh, the storm clouds will gather around Donald Trump as we move into spring and the snow melts and the court cases uh, accumulate and that's going to take a second look at who's going to be our nominee and so we don't want to be saddled with somebody that is as i said a failed candidate uh, that's going to be distracted with everything and maybe even disqualified for the ballot mm. and so i'm raising that voice it helps me somewhere and others it hurts me Hey, Governor. Ari Melber, thanks for joining us. You bring up uh, the promises of pardons, which suggests that it's an open secret uh, that a former president can not only be tried but convicted, because to get a pardon, that would be the situation, uh, while his lawyers argue the opposite, as you know. Uh, and you bring up the future. Do you think there is a, a possibility that there could be buyer's remorse if he is uh, convicted, double convicted, triple convicted before Election Day for your party? Well, I think actually the polls show that, that if there's an actual conviction, then uh, that uh, changes the dynamics within the Republican base. There's many just says, we can't do that. It's going to be a, uh, a nominee that can't win in November. And so, yes, there's going to be regrets about that. And that's why Donald Trump is trying to tie this up very quickly. And sometimes I think the media buys into the idea that we got to narrow the field so quickly. He would love to narrow the field just to have one person that you're running against. And so I think that plays into his hands. He wants to wrap it up quickly uh, because the further it goes, the more truth that's revealed, uh, the more angst that's con uh, raised concerns for the electorate. So I think the dynamics change next year. We got to keep this thing moving, got to keep candidates in there so we can fight the battle this spring. 
Governor, you mentioned it a couple times, which is absolutely accurate. This is an ongoing primary. This is just the beginning, the caucus tonight. Where do you expect uh, Donald Trump to get his biggest challenge? New Hampshire is one. Are there other states that you have your eye on where you don't think the electorate uh, is going to line up behind him? You know, actually, uh, whenever you look at uh, New Hampshire, obviously, uh, that's a state that uh, will, uh, I think, be very close uh, for Donald Trump, and I think there's a chance that uh, his star will diminish at that time. You look uh, further into uh, the South, actually, I think, uh, uh, whenever you look at California, which is a Super Tuesday state, uh, I see that as an opportunity uh, that, uh, you know, we can have an alternative that can have some success in a state like California and Colorado. And, uh, you know, it's a challenge within the Republican Party because some of them, they see Donald Trump threatened and then they want to move to a caucus. But in the primary system, I think there's some real opportunities uh, whenever you get to the Midwestern states. Understood. And Governor Hutchinson, I appreciate you making time for us on a busy night for you, the Iowa caucus. We are going to wait and count the votes, so we're not doing any counting until then. Appreciate you joining us. I will tell everyone coming up, Jen and I have a special report. We've been our working first. On, our first ever. Yes, We've together. Been, we're working on together. And it will deal with everything from history to what to watch for tonight to, yes, this weather. But first, coming up, Heather McGee on the threat to democracy as we also mark, of course, an important day in America, Martin Luther King Jr.'s holiday. We're back in just one minute. Biden's four years are over. I think we do need to move on from him. Um, I think... Uh, Anybody would be better than that. We're just hours away from the Iowa caucuses. The 2024 election cycle officially kicking off on Martin Luther King Day. Joining me now, is joining us now, really, is Heather McGee, board chair at Color of Change and author of The Sum of Us. Heather, thank you so much for taking the time this evening. I mean, it is a little jarring that this is happening on Martin Luther King Day, which is why it's so important to discuss. And I, I just wanted to ask you about some of the polls that have been a little jarring to me in Iowa about some of the positions that have been defended. I mean, first of all, an Iowa poll, a recent Iowa poll, uh, it, it said that I, in terms of how strongly Republican caucus goers identify with MAGA, it's a huge percentage, 18% ultra MAGA, 22% regular MAGA. I mean, that's not, not necessarily surprising, but still a little jarring. They've also been echoing and supporting some of the, I will say, racist terminology that Donald Trump has used. What do, what do you make of that? You know, thanks so much for having me on this very important day in our history. This is the 39th uh, time that this country has celebrated Martin Luther King's uh, birthday, and he would have been 95 today. He was killed before he turned 40. And so much of what he fought for is really still uh, an ongoing struggle and a journey to really have this country be a place uh, where we experience the, the brotherhood of man and the beloved community that he spoke to. And I think it's it's really the kind of polling that you're seeing that show that the ideas, the rhetoric, the zero-sum narrative that is so a core part of the MAGA vision, that is so a core part of Trump's sort of brand, the fact that that is as popular as it is today means that we're still in a contest. Mm. It means that his message is very clear. Uh, it is a message uh, aimed primarily at white Americans saying, fear and distrust your neighbor. Uh, you know, progress for people of color or even the presence of people of color is a direct threat to you. And it's a narrative that gets 24-7, you know, wall-to-wall -wall coverage from conservative talk radio to cable news. It's clear and it's promoted very widely. At the same time, research that we have done has shown that, in fact, most Americans can hold really competing ideas and visions of the country in the mm -hmm. same uh, sort of breath. And what really matters is who's speaking to them the loudest, uh, who is sort of calling them to their better angels. And we have the same kind of polling that shows, for example, that nearly 70 percent of Iowa voters don't support book bans, right? Something mm. that has been so important to the Republican agenda, um, you know, from Nikki Haley denying uh, slavery was a cause of the Civil War, you know, revealing that she was a part of a segregation academy um, and wanting to have that kind of book ban across the country to obviously DeSantis and Trump. And so I think we need to recognize that we need to be out there fighting for the hearts and minds of yeah. Americans every single day. 
And Heather, we wanted to have you on today to turn to the holiday in addition to the wider context. We're obviously in special elections coverage. And I'm curious if you could talk to us a little bit about the story we tell ourselves. Um, it's Martin Luther King Day, so we can think about both the darkness and the light, if I may. And the story we tell ourselves sometimes is we're better than this. Um, and that can be a bridge because Dr. King talked that way sometimes, but only enforced by action. Um, and That's then the right. other part of the story, the darkness is, this is who we've always been. Uh, right now, we're dealing with the popularity of autocratic leadership and violence, violence in place of politics. Uh, that's not new to our history. It's not new to Martin Luther King Day. We mark an assassination. It's not new to the uh, civil rights and black struggle in America, where the threat and use of violence was a constant feature. Um, so I'm curious if you could, you know, speak to us, educate us a little bit about that, because there's hope. I don't think it has to be all of us forever. Um, but there's also reality of violence against peaceful or civic action, which hangs over, of course, the coup trial and the future, mm -hmm. uh, that's very, mm -hmm. very redolent to many of America's communities for a long time. That's right. And what happens when we ignore our history, when we ban books, when we um, deny the basic facts of how we've never truly been uh, a truly representative multiracial democracy? We've always had to struggle for that. It's always been a contest between the many and the few uh, to have a seat at the table. When we deny that truth, we fail to give ordinary Americans a chance to be the heroes in the story. Right, because if everything that was important, every struggle uh, for justice, either happened, you know, in Dr. King's day and is finished and complete, and now all we have to do is be a colorblind society, then what is the everyday American to do in the face of inequality today, of widespread poverty, of mass incarceration, of police violence? Right, you're not called to be a part of a movement if you pretend that it all happened in the in the past, and of course. If you deny that it ever happened at all, then you fail to see the everyday heroes, white, black, and brown, who helped make this country truly uh, pull forward into the future throughout our history. And so I think today, which is you know oftentimes talked about as a day of service, I think it's more important for us to think about what we are going to do with our time on this earth, to recommit to the ideals that actually do unite Americans. There's a new annual poll called the Heart of America poll from the National Collaborative for Health Equity that shows that eight in 10 Americans believe that we should uh, have diversity in the world workplace and that we should educate children about the history of racism in America, including three and four Republicans. And I know that sounds like, well, what is that? How could that possibly be the same Republican Party uh, that supports Donald Trump. It's because fundamentally, just as we've always been a somewhat divided nation, we hear every day narratives that want to push us apart from politicians, from paid bullies in the corporate media. And we also hear in our communities, in our places of worship, narratives that want to pull us together. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to keep contending and fighting for the story that will help America survive yeah. as it becomes more and more racially diverse. Uh, Heather McGee on a big day, a big night for more than one reason. Thank you for joining us. I want to tell everyone what is still ahead. I was surprises from Obama to Cruz. Remember, Trump lost in the 2016 cycle. As mentioned, this is our first joint special report that Jen and I have ever done and how a conviction for defendant Trump could sink his whole campaign. And that's based on new Republican polling. Welcome back. For all the talk, bluster, and debates, tonight is the first time we'll hear from voters in this 2024 campaign. It's the first time Republicans are assessing Trump since his indictments. And there has been a lot of speculation about diehard fans just looking past Trump's legal problems, however bad they get. Trump fans often dismiss his controversies while reiterating their support. We've seen that in recent polling. And the final Iowa poll does find a sizable Trump lead. But beyond the horse race, the NBC Register poll also asks hardcore Republican activists if a future Trump conviction could change their vote. And even though these are the most active, most partisan Republicans in Iowa, and most do say they'll stand by Trump regardless, there's also tonight perilous news here for Trump and good news for Biden, depending on the trials. Because while most Republicans in Iowa say it does not matter to them if Trump is convicted of a crime, fully one out of five 
brand new, say a conviction makes them less likely to support Trump. And this new finding that you see right here actually undercuts the Trump MAGA narrative or hope that he could withstand even a conviction this year. One-fifth of Republican voters is a fifth of the base that he cannot afford, cannot afford to lose. If Trump gets the nomination, he does start in a hole, remember, because he lost to Biden before. He's got to hold the Republican base, not lose them, and then try to build on that. So these colliding timelines of Trump's trials and the campaign schedule do pose problems. Trump's trial schedule has all four criminal trials starting before Election Day, as you see here, as they are scheduled. So if even some of that schedule holds, then we could get verdicts in several of these trials. And that builds on Trump's obvious problems, even according to Republicans. As the classic 21 Savage line goes, how many problems you got? A lot. How many lawyers you got? A lot. And now, how many trials you got? A lot. Now, of course, that is a throwback, as true 21 fans might know. But on the brand new album, he also says, watches from my shoulder way down to my wrist. Every story got a twist. Well, this story's twist could be a Trump conviction that even has MAGA Republicans bailing on him on the way to losing another race. Now. As I told you, Jen Psaki and I are here for the full hour, and our special report, which we promised, is next. Stay with us. For coverage of tonight's Iowa caucuses. And now we turn to a special report. It's here. Oh, it's here. It's finally here. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this is going to draw on some of our reporting, your experiences with this state, which starts the presidential campaign every four years. So I'm going to get us started, and then I know you have some thoughts as well. So let's have at it. Tonight's Iowa vote follows a long tradition with candidates going old school with the grassroots campaigning from diners to farms. Two candidates even did all 99 counties, and Jen has more to say about that in a moment. But the political class is also fixated on this idea of two tickets out of Iowa. Polls show Trump in the lead, Haley possibly picking up steam. So that part follows the past years, the traditions we know. Other things, though, are different this year. One candidate is indicted and awaiting trials for his attempted coup. The weather will be the coldest ever. Take a New York Times report, which notes this unpredictable and quirky process now features dangerously cold weather and an unusually uncompetitive contest. Now, that's a reference to the early polling and the Beltway pundits' fairly broken habit of treating polls as if they were results. Now, the truth is, we don't know how uncompetitive tonight or this year is going to be until people vote this year. But the largest difference of all is the most obvious. An ex-president is now running. That's never happened in Iowa's history for either party. If you imagine a former president running in, say, a Democratic primary after previously consolidating the party and proving they can win the White House, you'd expect them to dominate any primary and pull a large majority of their party. And Trump may ultimately do exactly that. But it's worth noting that the Beltway political and media crowd, which largely got 2016 wrong, got the last midterm election wrong, if you followed that, and routinely is wrong in overestimating early polls, especially those very early national polls, well, that's part of the crowd, along with some conservatives, hyping another Trump polling bonanza right now. Trump is in dominant position in Iowa. The polling has never historically had a, any, a, any candidate so far ahead. Trump doing a whole lot better in consolidating the party. It's really hard to imagine in the next week how Trump is going to do anything except sweep Iowa. Sweep. And that may be what happens tonight. But there are also signs that a whole lot of Republican voters are still mulling at least a potential alternative to Trump. Consider, even if the current Iowa polls are in the ballpark, if you look at it holistically, about 46% of these Republican activists who know Trump well by now are mulling other candidates even after Trump being president. Same with New Hampshire's primary voting pool, which does lean more independent. And that's just in Republican primaries right now. In a general election, a whopping 58% say they'd be dissatisfied if Trump is the nominee. That's bad. 
a major hurdle, even apart from those trials we mentioned. Now, that same poll found a very similar 56 percent equally dissatisfied if Biden's the nominee. But it's hard to square the beltway talk of Trump's supposed resilience or dominance with the actual views of voters. Indeed, it's kind of funny if you think about the Trump and Biden example, we hear a lot more sometimes about a kind of a disaffected, uninterested view of Biden when him and Trump have similar numbers on that same question I just showed you. Now, Trump is benefiting from a splintered opposition, which he also benefited from in 16. Remember, he got the nomination only after a long fight in a large field. In the end, he pulled still less than half of all Republicans who voted in those primaries. It was about 45 percent total, or as you see there, about 14 million votes. He also lost 13 states, even to someone, and I say this respectfully and diplomatically, a politician who's not known for his popularity, Senator Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz is your projected winner of the Iowa First in the Nation caucuses. Trump underperformed the polls and expectations. We finished second, and I want to tell you something. I'm just honored. Former Vice President Joe Biden will win Pennsylvania and Nevada, putting him over the 270 electoral votes he needs to become the 46th president of the United States. A little bit of history. Now, these results show the limits, at least, of some polls. They are, of course, part of the picture because it's part of the process. Now, Jen, you were, of course, working in the Iowa caucus 20 years ago this month. Hard to believe. It's a fact. <laughs> um, and from there, of course, to your White House work to now your work here. So we're going to turn to you. Right. So, look, as Ari says, you just said, polls can be imperfect, but they also tell you a lot. And the latest NBC News Des Moines Register poll does show Trump at 48 percent, compared to Nikki Haley at 20 percent, which is, of course, a jump for her. She's now above Ron DeSantis, which is a contrast to December. Ron DeSantis is at 16 percent. And while these numbers do show Haley in second place for the first time, as I just said, they also show what looks to be a big enthusiasm gap among her supporters. A massive 40-point enthusiasm gap, actually, in terms of excitement Trump supporters have, very enthusiastic for him, 40, 49% have for him, and Haley supporters have for her, which is more like 9%, according to this poll. And while DeSantis is close behind in the overall number, actually has a higher enthusiasm number, his numbers show he's been moving in the wrong direction. That's not what you want in terms of momentum, in a state that he has basically staked his campaign on. But as any political observer worth their salt knows, including those who did caucuses 20 years ago, and again, for Obama, back in 2008, there are a range of factors that go into determining the outcome. And we're watching all of them, especially when the pool of voters in Iowa caucuses and the pool of likely voters is so small and the temperature is below freezing. It's not really a matter of whether or not Trump wins. I mean, a Trump loss here would be shocking. But for the other candidates, a second place finish is kind of a win for any of them. At a minimum, it gives them a rationale for keeping their campaign going, going on to New Hampshire and South Carolina, Nevada, Super Tuesday even. It also gives them a rationale for coalescing support from the candidates who drop out. They'll at least make the pitch to them that they are the one to take on Trump. It's also important to remember that we are technically just at the beginning here. Votes are happening in the caucus tonight. Iowa isn't historically the final decider of who the nominee will be. Only three presidents since 1972 won their Iowa caucuses. Jimmy Carter in 1976, Barack Obama in 2008, I was there for that one, and George W. Bush in 2000. And there are a few Iowa losers who went on to win. Ronald Reagan in 1980, George H.W. Bush in 1988, and of course, Donald Trump in 2006. And specifically on the Republican side, it may be losing importance because the last three eventual GOP nominees all lost the Iowa caucuses. And Trump hasn't exactly spent a lot of time and energy himself in the state, even if his organization is improved from the last time. But there are also a few factors that don't always fully show up in the polls that are important to talk about and really pay attention to. According to an NBC News tally, since May 23rd of last year, Trump held 38 events in 15 counties. That's by far the fewest, fewest as I just noted. But what, according to experts on the ground, he has also put in place a far more professional campaign operation than he had in back in 2016. And at least when it comes to the Republican primary electorate, his strategy of using his court appearances, as he did last week, as basically campaign rallies, has essentially worked with the Republican electorate, even though he hasn't spent as much time in the state. DeSantis has held 174 events in all 99 counties. 
meaning as awkward as he can be as a candidate, and he can be super awkward, he's put in the work. He's put in the work in the state. And to people in Iowa, that often matters. And DeSantis appears to be using much of the playbook that Senator Ted Cruz used in winning the Iowa caucus in 2016. We'll see if it actually works, but he's using some things from that playbook. Now, for Haley, for her part, has done 64 events in 30, 30 counties, and she's also benefiting from the support of what's called crossover Democrats, who re-registered to vote for her, as well as independents. That's a good percentage. She's doing the best among those groups. Finally, as unappealing as he can be, I mean that, as Ari would say, in the most diplomatic of ways, Vivek has truly barnstormed the state. I mean, he's done a whopping 303 events in all 99 counties. And of course, there's ad spending, which, right, Nikki Haley is outspending everyone else. She's been pouring about $3 million a week into TV ads. The one factor, of course, that none of them can control is Mother Nature. She seems to be making it very cold there right now. Yeah, and shout out to Mother Nature. Uh, weather... She's one of the, been making her presence known. She has not only made her presence known, she's reminded us all that we're just human beings. And candidates can't control the weather, not even a president. Tonight's turnout, as you've probably heard, has become a question of enthusiasm and weather preparation. These are rice noodles that just got cooked. The water is still boiling hot. Look, we did it! So 35 minutes in negative 16 degree weather here in Iowa. You want the Trump snowman, baby. That's how they roll here in Iowa. I think with younger people, it may be an issue. You know, I think especially because a lot of us aren't driving to our locations. Is there any amount of cold that will keep people from caucusing for Trump Monday night? Um, Alaska cold might slow us down, but not Iowa cold. If you've ever lived in a cold state, I've spent time in Iowa and Michigan. Jen spent time in Iowa. You probably know about that kind of cold competition. Take it all together, to go, though, tonight. And the one tradition that can still redeem this Iowa experiment, from the cold to some of the other absurdities, is that a small state that hosts grassroots campaigning, like all those county visits Jen was just walking us through, can still empower people to try to break the stranglehold of big money, big polling, which you heard me criticize tonight, and big bellway predictions, which are so often wrong, you wonder why they get paid for them. That means take it all together and you can still sometimes on the ground get an upset. I thought we'd come in first or second. I was hoping to come in first. I do. But to uh, come in two to one ahead of the next candidate was a very gratifying thing. Game on. Thank you so much, Iowa. <laughs> Iowa, I love you. I love you. God bless the great state of Iowa. In this election, we are ready to believe again. Thank you, Iowa. Thank you, Iowa. A lot of those people were counted out. I think, I think you know the last one. I know that guy. I worked for him for about <laughs> 10 years. I mean, it's a... 250,000 people turned out to caucus for the year that Barack Obama won the caucus, which is a huge number. So even as we talk about numbers tonight, it's important to put things in perspective. Yeah, and that goes to the grassroots. That campaign, which you were a part of, altered that turnout universe. And for all the talk about polling, a lot of it is a prediction about who's going to turn out. A bet. A bet, if you will. And so we're going to wait and count the votes. Um, we're going to continue this convo with Jason Johnson, our special guest, next. Then with the weather, most people are predicting that it'll be a smaller turnout than has been maybe in 2016, for example. And, and if that's true, our folks are motivated to come out. I mean, they're going to come out, you know, whether it's negative 20, whether it's negative 10. Joining us now is Jason Johnson, professor of politics and journalism at Morgan State University, host of the podcast A Word on Slate. Dot com. So, Jason, we've, we've heard a lot of predictions from candidates about what the impact will be of a variety of things, Mother Nature, the excitement of their supporters. What are you watching tonight in terms of things that could have an impact, and what is a pretty small electorate? The first thing I'm looking for is whose donors are going to call and say jump out first, right? Oh. Because there, there's been this narrative, Jen, uh, of, of people saying, well, there's one or two tickets out of Iowa. Look, I understand the logic behind that, but there's only one ticket out of Iowa, out of Iowa right? No one's getting flued out of Iowa. No one is getting a, a consolation prize. Either you beat Donald Trump or you're the first loser. There are no moral victories against an amoral candidate, right? So everybody who's running right now 
isn't even in the race to beat Donald Trump. That's not going to happen. They're in a race to keep their, their donors happy. Because if you get blown out by 20, 30, some ridiculous amount of points, you're going to have your big spender say, hey, Ron, why are we doing this? Hey, Vivek, why don't you just start that podcast? Hey, Nikki, maybe it's not going to happen. So that's what I'm looking at. But the people who spent $30 million, more than a million on this race, I got to see how they're going to be able to keep their funders behind them after they lose to Donald Trump. When you look at what I mentioned earlier, which is the overemphasis of polling and predictions, mm -hmm. Um, stacked against what you're talking about, which is a, there is a Republican uh, elite financial support for something other than Trump. And there is anywhere from, as I mentioned, 35 to 50 plus percent looking at alternatives depending on the cycle. Um, how much does that affect then the, the spread? In other words, you think that uh, the Trump people are going around saying if they get above 13, uh, that's the biggest margin ever. Of course, there's never been a former president running. Uh, but what do you think the real spread is for those people, the political people? I think for the political people, they're looking for a spread that's under 20, right? Like, because there have been some polls that show, you know, Trump at 70 something, 57 percent. If, if, if Trump gets 40 and Nikki Haley gets 23, I think she can keep people surrounding her saying, you know what, we can push this through. Maybe we can push this through all the way to South Carolina. But for Ron DeSantis, I mean, he's, he's not in that position, right? If he ends up being a distant third or even four or five points behind Nikki Haley, it's going to be a problem. And Ari, we, we talk about this all the time. We're beyond the prediction game, right? This isn't like guessing, predicting, throwing numbers down. These are the raw numbers that have stayed solid for a long time. And, and here's the other part that's key. The Haley campaign and, and her super PACs has spent about $30 million. DeSantis has spent almost $30 million. You know, Tim Scott, who dropped out almost two months ago, he spent $14 million. What you're looking at is a situation where Donald Trump may have spent less than Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, and he's still going to beat them by 15 points. No one's going to see a return on investment if that's what ends up happening. So people are looking for a spread of less than 13, very likely, to stay funding these campaigns. And that's what I think the Haley campaign should really be focusing on right now. And Ron DeSantis, this might be his final night. I mean, let, let's talk about Ron DeSantis for a moment. You just raised him. Um, does he have to get, if he's in third, if he's close to Haley, can he make a pitch to his supporters that he's going to stay in? What does he need to do to feel viable, at least to the people who are going to fund his flights uh, to New Hampshire and other states? Jen, I, I hate to overuse this lyric, but there's 99 counties and he may not win one, right? Wow. Like he's, Ron DeSantis is that. He wrote it down. He wrote it down well. over we here. Just, now that's Sean Carter. Okay, got <laughs> yeah, it. He's going to reuse that later tonight. We're going to we bet go. on it. Uh, <laughs> He has to at least get, like, Marco Rubio numbers, right? There's got to be a few yellow counties here and there that Ron DeSantis can go back to his donors and say, hey, there's a reason to stick with me. If he can't show that, if he can't show that he's pulled some actual counties in after starting up here and dropping down here, there's just no enthusiasm for it anymore, and there's no money. Yeah. And at this point, money might be more important than enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Jason, I don't know if you've ever heard this expression. Sometimes you'll see it on signs. Slippery, here it comes. Here it slippery comes. when wet. I've never understood that. Wet <laughs> means slippery. Like, if you have a fish in water... You're slippery? Yeah. Yeah. Wet, it's a, syn a synonym. So I've never understood that. Well, what about slippery when icy? Because it is another part that's hanging over all this. We love mm -hmm. to talk about our numbers and all our history because that's the type of people we maybe are. Nerdy. But, <laughs> nerdy. But the weather matters. Take a look at what candidates are saying. If we have it. We could summarize it. No? <laughs> I'm asking you to brave the elements. And just don't go by the polls. The polls show that we're leading by so much. But uh, we have to get out there. Every one of us have to get out there. It's going to be negative 15. But I'm going to be out there. And I want you to go out there. Could weather matter more than the spending and the ads you mm. just referenced? Uh, it, it could, Ari, especially when you're talking about some of these smaller rural counties. Now, again, this is this is a matter of where you are. There may be some places where it's like, hey, they've cleaned the roads, some places where they haven't cleaned the roads. It is only one vote. But again, I've said this before, when you're talking about tremendously cold weather, if I don't think my candidate has a chance, right, then 
why am I going to brave the weather, right? I, I don't think Ron DeSantis is going to win, even though he's my guy. Mm. I don't think Nikki's going to win, she, you know, even though she's my candidate. The only way this could potentially flip the other way yeah. is if Trump supporters say he's got it in the bag and they don't show up, and then we get an upset. Yeah, and that's why it is unpredictable. Jason Johnson on more than one topic with more than one reference. We thank you. Uh, Jen and I are here, and we want to remind everyone, we are now five minutes away from Rachel taking over special coverage. Steve Kornacki at the big board will also be around later yeah. tonight. So that all is coming right after this break. We'll be right back.